are pending at the various regional houses of chiefs can be dealt with expeditiously. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Domini, there have been numerous chieftaincy disputes in several parts of the country, including the Greater Accra region. I am particular about the Greater Accra region because it happens to be our national capital. There has been a protracted chieftaincy dispute with respect to the position of Gamanche. But thankfully, we now have a Gamanche whose name has been entered into the Gazette and who is a member of the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. He was duly inducted into that position some time ago. But it appears there are challenges with respect to his attempt to properly occupy the seat of Gamanche and to have the recognition of all. If you're given the nod, what would you do to resolve this protracted dispute once and for all? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's the need, the ministry actually doesn't install chiefs. The selection, nomination, and the instrument or instrument of a chief is the sole preserve of the kingmakers or the family or the lineage from which a particular individual comes from. But the regional house of chief has a mandate to ensure that when disputes are sent there, they are dealt with expeditiously. When given the nod, whatever cooperation that these regional houses of chiefs need to ensure that these disputes are disposed of expeditiously, I will give the support. The other thing has to do with the enforcement of the judgments that are given by the court. Sometimes the courts, whether the traditional council or even at the Supreme Court, might give rulings relating to who is the legitimate chief. So when these judgments are given, the expectation is that they will be, they will be respected and whatever cooperation that will be needed to ensure that the judgments of the courts are enforced, I'll give my commitment when I'm giving them up. My last question. Do, do you think the chieftain's institution is still relevant in a democratic dispensation such as ours? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chieftaincy institution is, is still relevant. But it's one of the revered institutions in our country. And the constitution of our country recognizes this institution and, and has guaranteed its existence under our constitution. Uh, the roles that they play in our day-to-day -day life and in our governance system is very important. So they are still relevant in our country. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Obama. Thank you, Honorable. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, chiefs in active politics. The Constitution frowns on that. And um, what is your take on um, some of the comments that chiefs do make when politicians visit them and the ensuing controversies that arise out of some of the co comments that are, are made by some of our chiefs during the political campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Constitution is specific that chiefs should not participate in active partisan politics. They are not supposed to wear party colors and attend rallies and show their political affiliations. Unfortunately, sometimes a few of them uh, go overboard. But the dichotomy or the distinction is a very interesting one. Because, uh, for instance, if uh, the president visits a community and the chief in the course of the interaction says that we wish to thank you for the free senior high school that you have introduced, are we going to say that that chief is participating in active partisan politics? I believe that is not so. 
So uh, in as much as the chiefs are not supposed to take part in active partisan politics, they are also part of the governance system. So whatever they do, I'm sure they are very mindful of the injunction that is imposed on them. And uh, they will do the needful. Thank you. Yes, Neil and Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, my interest is in local governance. Colonial era, the chiefs were very, very instrumental in the governance of the people. When we decided to transcend to democracy, we decided to go with decentralization. Decentralization in certain federal states virtually hinges on traditional authorities. But in Ghana, their significance in local governance has waned so much that, I don't know, but there is even a ruling at the Supreme Court that will further take away some of the authorities that they have in ensuring that our local laws, cultures, and traditions are obeyed. You and I will grow up, we all know we grew up in rural areas where it was almost like you have to look for a place to hide when you are summoned before the, the chief. The chiefs have the authority to enact certain laws and they within a community. Today, all those with so-called modernity, all those powers have been eroded. And as such, it's taken away some of these cohesive forces we have within our local government system. What will you do as a minister for chieftaincy to make sure that we reintroduce the value system that places some authority and significance on our traditional authorities so that they can also be confident enough in exercising some authority to support us in central government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would collaborate with the National House of Chiefs, the Regional House of Chiefs, and the various traditional councils to have an in-depth study into some of the causes of these happenings and then offer appropriate solutions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, some people have argued that in order to arrest some of these things, uh, it would be good for some people who believe in our traditional value system to go to court, the Supreme Court, and ask for the review of that uh, unfortunate judgment. Do you agree to that opinion as a lawyer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time for even applying for a review in that particular case has even elapsed. Uh, the National House of Chiefs is in the process of proposing some amendments to Section 63D, which was shut down by the Supreme Court. I'm very certain that uh, when I'm giving the notes, there will be deeper collaboration with the National House of Chiefs to see, in conjunction with the Attorney General, how that particular provision can be recrafted to give meaning and effect to the interment of the earlier provision. Thank you. Chairman, another, we are in a period of gender. One of the most significant appeals that have been made, which to me makes sense, is from our Queen Mothers, who believe that in constituting the National House of Chief, Queen Mothers are not given any place. What do you think can be done in these days and civilization of gender equality and the rest. Do you think that we could do something in order to make sure that our queen mothers are also duly represented at the National House of Chiefs? The queen mothers saw a demand that there is effective and continuous stakeholder engagement so that as an institution, is this something that collectively they will buy into, then you can proceed from there. Thank you.
this one is a bit controversial, but forgive me. Uh, given the absence of leadership on our side, just some clarification. A full help. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, the question relating to Queen Maddox. You are mindful of Article 271. Article 271. The House of Chiefs of each region shall elect as members of the National House of Chiefs five paramount chiefs from the region. Where in a region there are fewer than five paramount chiefs, the House of Chiefs of the region shall elect such number of divisional chiefs as shall make up the required representation of chiefs for the region. Is it not clear who the regional House of Chiefs can send to um, the National House of Chiefs? It is very clear that every regional House of Chiefs has to send five representatives to the National House of Chiefs. And where the number is less, divisional chiefs will step in for them. So how, how, how does the issue of uh, Queen Mothers come in here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was a suggestion. That was why I was saying that that would demand broader stakeholder consultations. I am not giving a, a, a definite answer that Queen Mothers will necessarily have to go to the National House of Chiefs. Thank you. Just consultation or constitutional amendment? The, it's a process. So if after the consultations there's the need to propose some amendments, I think that would be considered. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, one serious mitigating factor against our fight against uh, environmental degradation and pollution of our water system, especially through illegal mining and the rest, have been identified by some people as a collaboration between landowners who possibly are subjects of traditional authorities. And in some jurisdictions, there is no way somebody can even farm on a particular land without authority from the traditional authority. What role do you think traditional authorities can play to effectively help us resolve the issue of environmental degradation, pollution of our waters, and the rest through illegal mining, chainsaw operation, and all these things that affect our fauna and folly? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My predecessor started something like that. That is a honorable jamisi. There was very good collaboration between himself and the Ministry of Lands and Forestry, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, and then the, the Operation Gallant Stop. So uh, this is something that can be continued. At the National House of Chiefs, there's one committee that is specifically tasked uh, natural resources and environment with the collaboration of the members of the National House of Chiefs. I think the chiefs can be strengthened or empowered to, to do more than what they are doing now. The other way is that sometimes the way people are giving permits to carry on prospecting or some activities in some of these communities is done at the flip side of some of these chiefs. You only see the presence of some of these investors or some of these people who have been given permits to work once they, when they visit your traditional area. I believe that when there's closer collaboration between all the stakeholders, the chiefs will continue to play a very significant role in protecting the environment. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm aware that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, you are minister designate for chieftaincy and religious affairs. In Ghana, 71% are Christians, 18% Muslims, 5% traditional religion, others one and 5% not really aligned. In all these, 
And my source is the Ghana Statistical Service 2020 Population and uh, Housing Census. All these religions are for LGBT. I take you to our laws, the criminal code. Section 104.1b clearly is again on natural canal knowledge. Then, to the people you are going to represent, the chiefs. They are the custodians of our customs and our culture. And you know that there is no space in our culture for LGBT rights. When you are given the nod, what will you do to ensure that LGBT is not close to our doors? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a Christian, and by the nature of my upbringing, I am against LGBTQI. Fortunately, our chiefs and some of these religious bodies have also spoken against the LGBTQI. When I'm given the opportunity and this decision comes up in, in cabinet, I am not going to recommend that these practices are encouraged in this country because, uh, for instance, our laws on marriage have not been amended. Marriage, as defined in our laws, is a union between a man and a woman. So with the, with the kind of situation that is going on now and the enthusiasm that we are getting from our religious leaders and our chiefs, I am very certain that when I'm nominated and I do some other consultations with them, because this decision actually is a state decision. My views may matter, but at the end of the day, it is the collective will of the good people of Ghana that will prevail in finding a lasting solution to these activities. Thank you. Second, the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, has made very strong statements about LGBTQ rights. As the policy advisor to the President on religious matters, are you going to advise the President to boldly come out and ask a matter of urgency, put the hearts of Ghanaians at ease, that LGBT rights will not be countenance on our land and even in our territorial waters, so that Ghanaians are at peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The President has already made a statement in respect of this practice. And the chiefs, as you rightly said, and some of our religious leaders have also made an input. Our listening president, I'm sure at the appropriate time, will make the necessary interventions. Thank you. Third, and so on LGBTQ, will you advocate for stiffer punishments for those who even uh, try to indulge in LGBTQ? Because, yes, he is in charge of our religion and he is going to take care of the chiefs who are the custodians of our customs. Are you going to advocate that as Minister for Religious Affairs, right. where I have already indicated that 71% are Christians, 18% are Islam, 5% traditional, and I mean, you see, Ghanaians generally, we don't like LGBT rights. But LGBTQ is too close to Ghana for comfort. Are you going to advocate for stiffer punishment for those engaged in it, because it's just a, a, a misdemeanor under 1041B. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The punishment regime will be determined by Parliament. And I believe that when such a bill is brought to Parliament, and I have the opportunity to speak on it, I'll, I'll make an input. Thank you. Honorable Member, today, under our laws, the thing we call LGBT and so on, what is the offense in it apart from unnatural canal knowledge? What in the so-called LGBT activities you know, apart from unnatural canal knowledge, will be amenable to the criminal codes of Ghana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, beyond the section 104 that deals with unnatural canal knowledge, the laws on marriage also state clearly that the marriage is a union between a man and a woman. 
So, apart from even the criminal sanctions, there are also sanctions for engaging in that kind of conduct because that is not what our law prescribes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now we are talking as lawyers. How is it possible for any other person, apart from a man and woman, to get married? To, to occasion an uh, offense anyway. Which, uh, which, are they, which marriage registrar would have the authority to uh, put a man and a man or a woman and a woman, admit them into a marriage. How is that possible under our law? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is not possible under our law. Our laws prohibit such unions. Yes, I know. Yeah, to be more specific, Chairman is asking you a number of questions. Now, Section 99 and the Section 104 of our Criminal Code are clear on unnatural carnal knowledge and the specificity that there is unnatural carnal knowledge if one can prove penetration, the list of it, is that okay? In the relationship between lesbians, lesbians, in the relationship between lesbians, there's no penetration, okay? So, how, how do I know? How, how do I know? How do I know? Okay. It, okay. Well, maybe, maybe there are experts in the practice here in this in this chamber. But I, I, I just assume that I just assume that in the relationship between lesbians, it may be difficult to prove penetration and etc. So, do you think that our laws? in any way, in any way, capture the situation of lesbians. Uh, if you look at Section 99 and the Section 104 of our Criminal uh, Code, and you talk about marriage, broadly speaking, if people in a homosexual relationship where we can't prove penetration, but they are living together in a house, they haven't proclaimed each other as husband and wife, and if people who are lesbian, uh, they are living together, they haven't proclaimed each other as husband and wife, are you able to capture them under our existing relationship and prosecute? I think that's the question. Are you able to prosecute people like that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's the need to expand the existing law to make provision for some of these happenings. The law in its current states. I have heard arguments that, as you are saying, yes, there is no penetration, and this is the definition of unnatural canonic. As a parliament, for us to ensure that the existing law, so that all these practices that are gradually emerging will be taken care of under our laws. Thank you. Uh, no, so, so first, and I'll come to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations once more. Uh, um, my first question has to do with uh, payment of royalties to chiefs. I'm sure that all our chiefs and queen mothers will be very much interested in this. Somewhere in 2017, January, your administration made a promise to ensure prompt payment of royalties due chiefs, queen mothers, and traditional councils. Um, I was trying to do a search to see um, how this promise has been kept. So far, there is nothing showing that this promise has been kept. How often will royalties be paid to chiefs under your administration as a minister? Thank you. The administration or the payment of royalties is not under my ministry directly. It's under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. When I'm giving the note, I will establish closer collaboration with the ministry so that these payments can be made as promptly as possible. Thank you. Much. Um, the second one has to do with uh, one action by uh, your government in 2017 when the military facilitated organization 
uh, of a trip to Israel for Ghanaian Christians. Uh, in fact, we were made to understand that it was an inaugural trip. Do you intend to continue in this trend where annually you'll be having pilgrimage to Israel for Christians? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is something that has been started by my predecessor. And until and unless there is some reason not to continue, it should be continued. Thank you very much. Neil, can you say that again? I didn't hear the last part of the answer. My response was that this is a, a program that has been started by my predecessor. Until and unless there's some other reason why it should not be continued. When I'm giving the note, I would continue with that project. Thank you. What would you do as a minister to uh, reduce government interference in the election of president of National House of Chiefs? Now, uh, having the perception that governments interfere with elections. Oh, no, no, how can he speak to a perception? Ask him his own views. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, what I want him to, to assure the committee and the general populace watching him that under his watch as a minister, he would ensure that that will not happen. And that is a commitment I wanted him to give the people of Ghana. I don't think he can give that commitment. He does not take part in the election. But, 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 so Mr. Chairman, but, Mr. Chairman the, my point is that he is the I'm not supervising going to ask another question, please. Very well, Mr. Chair. Um, Honorable nominee, in the NPP manifesto of 2016, you also promised that you are going to create an enabling legislative and economic environment for philanthropy to blossom under your ministry. How do you intend carrying this uh, out? Please, the question again. Uh, there was a promise that the MPP will create the enabling legislative and economic environment for philanthropy that is a culture of giving to blossom. And I'm asking how do you intend doing this? Honorable, do you have any ideas how to make philanthropy blossom? Mr. Chairman, I, 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 this is something that will have to come from the individual. Once an offer is made to them and they have the willingness to assist. I'm sure they should be able to help. Thank you. As a final follow-up, um, there has been concerns about how long... I don't remember how many questions you want to... I, I thought I'm done. I'm looking here for the opportunity. Oh, that, that's yeah, an answer. Yeah, over here. Chairman. Thank you very much, sir. Honorable Chairman. Honorable Chairman, the succession to the various stools and schemes has become the major source of chieftaincy disputes in this country. Sometimes it results in exchange of guns, fights, to the extent that people get wounded and are hospitalized. What plans do you have to ensure that we streamline this succession plan to avoid chieftaincy disputes? In, in Ghana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Already, the National House of Chiefs has started a process of documentation of the various successions to the stools and skins. Uh, when I'm giving the nod, I intend collaborating with them on another level where, if it is possible to introduce DNA genealogy database, which will serve as a complement to what is already existing. Because now you trace your ancestry through a family tree to somebody who has a legitimate right to occupy a stool or a skin. So with this kind of collaboration, the, there can be some certainty as to which persons or individuals are 
eligible to contest some of these tools as and when they become vacant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there have been ongoing discussions about whether or not churches should pay tax to the state. What would be your position on this? Uh, yes, that churches should pay tax. What would be your position on it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Churches, when they operate as churches, are not amenable to pay taxes. It is when they carry on business that they should be made to pay tax. And I think that is the position that I'll continue to advance. Thank you. Honorable member, when you say when they operate as churches, what they do with the money that accrues to them, who follows up to show that, in fact, apart from paying church workers, the rest should be for charitable work. Who follows to ensure that the monies they get from collections, they, they use it for the charitable work they are supposed to use it for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Ghana Revenue Authority has a responsibility to, just as they do when companies present their annual statements to say that these are deductible expenses, these are not. They should be able to follow up on some of these uh, income that are produced to some of these churches to determine appropriately whether those incomes are chargeable for in, uh, tax purposes or not. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Churches, uh, Muslim religious sects, and etc. So let's just not limited to churches, but all religious organizations. Do they, or are they supposed to operate under a legal framework? Because when you decide to operate and take money from people and etc., are you to incorporate as a company limited by guarantee or what kind? Because we talk about when they do business. So when they do business, they are supposed to register a company um, a limited liability company to be able to do business or incorporate as a cooperative or whatever legal framework. Now, when they are not to do business and they are to pursue a social purpose, are they to register as a company limited by guarantee or anybody can just wake up, go and set up a structure and then call people to come and ask them to make contributions and then nobody accounts for the money in addition, the salaries and emoluments of the leadership of the religious sects using the money contributions, are they supposed to pay taxes on that? Is there a, a mechanism, a framework for holding religious groups accountable? That's, that's fundamentally the question. The issue about regulating churches is a very dicey one because of the provisions in the Constitution that guarantees freedom of worship association, etc. When priests or members of religious bodies receive salaries, they are supposed to pay income on those salaries. The law is clear on that one. Churches are also allowed to register under our Companies Act as companies limited by guarantee. So, that is the, the, the provision of the law. But to, to ask them to pay taxes based on the other work that they do, which is unrelated to their religious activities, that one, the law permits those payments to be made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the power of God to heal. But sometimes you realize that somebody is sick, somebody is diabetic, and that the person has reduced. Instead of seeking for medical attention, you, the person ends up in prayer camps and continues to pray fast to worsen his or her uh, condition. Honorable nominee, 
what will you do to ensure that churches, uh, I mean prayer camps are advised to encourage, encourage patients who come to them or uh, their members who come to them to seek for spiritual healing, referring them to seek medical attention when need be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a question of faith. Uh, if the individual believes that when he's sick and he goes to a pastor or a priest and he prays for him or her, he can get his salvation, we cannot take away that belief in that faith from him or her. But going forward, when I'm giving the note, there should be enough education for some of these adherents or some of these church worshippers to know the difference between an ailment that needs medical attention and the other one that has to do with the salvation of your soul. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Giselle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, there's often a case of noise pollution caused by some churches and residents and people in, who live in residential areas. Uh, there are some conflicts in, let's say, the planning, the planning and location of some of these um, churches. What are you going to be able to do or help to alleviate the challenges that people have? Even though they may be Christians, but some of the churches can be making a lot of noise. High, much higher, um, above the average decibel permitted level, let me put it that way, for residential areas. It's quite common in residential areas, but generally on the whole, what are you going to be able to do to be able to bring some sanity into that aspect? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The noise levels are relative, and if the uh, fiscal planning departments of most of these assemblies are on top or are doing their work very well, there are, in the course of the fiscal planning, areas are demarcated for churches, mosques, and other religious facilities. So that coordination or that collaboration should exist. The other one has to do with tolerance levels. We live in a community where we have to tolerate each other. So whilst people have a right to express their religious beliefs, we have to marry it with a kind of noise that is permissible within a certain environment. So that will need a lot of dialogue and give and take so that we can coexist in these communities. Thank you. So would you, Mr. Chairman, would you give the assurance that you you would liaise with the local government authorities and so on because it is an issue. Some people may not be able to voice it out, but on this platform we have the opportunity to voice it out for people who are disturbed by the noise. That doesn't mean that they are against their religion or the worship. It's just that sometimes it can be creating noise. Would you collaborate in that manner? Thank you. Honorable Member, I give you the assurance that that collaboration will be there. Thank you. My second question has to do with development in districts and the traditional, in collaboration with traditional councils. Now, would you recommend or would you support a structure, a more official structure of development being supported by all these stakeholders? That is that kind of policy direction coming from the top, such that every traditional council, every traditional area, for example, has that developmental committee, or even maybe going beyond the committee. I don't know what structure it is. Just that, to make sure that there's that formalization. Because sometimes when there are some disputes, if there was a committee in that manner with all the stakeholders involved, maybe there could be some resolution along the way that, look, all we want is development. Because very often, you and I know, we go to see the chiefs, and they all say the same. All we want is development. How can we all push this developmental agenda in a much more structured and proper way? How could you support that as Minister of Chieftaincy coming into the picture? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Already the structure at the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assembly levels 
makes provision for the involvement of chiefs in the selection of the government appointees to the various assemblies. So there's this collaboration already in existence. When I'm giving the nod, we will strengthen this collaboration so that the kind of development that we have or we are expecting in the various metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies are achieved. Thank you. One last follow-up question to this. Your so, last question, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. So you are looking at it from collaboration with the district assemblies, but I'm looking at it from the other way around. The chiefs are strong. We are powerful. Can there also be that structure to support them also on their side? Otherwise, they will be skewed towards just coming to what the district assembly wants to do. There must be that connection and collaboration so that both is a win-win situation for both. So they don't have to because representation will be just a few. It is not the whole traditional council who may be able to represent it on the district assembly. And there may, ever, there may never even be a time when the whole district assembly leadership will be meeting with the traditional council and discussing things together. I hope you see where I'm coming from. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chiefs themselves are also agents of development in their various traditional areas. Sometimes there are situations where they themselves initiate certain projects and bring them to the various municipal, metropolitan, and district assemblies for assistance. And when these offers come, they are considered favorable. Thank you. Yeah, no good at all. Most grateful, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my first question relates to a very sensitive matter which borders on religious charlatans. A few bad nuts who give religion a very bad name and endanger society. Uh, indeed, uh, Jesus the Christ himself warned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, and if I have the permission of the chairman to quote from my Bible, Jesus the Christ said, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 24, verse 11 and 12. You're seeing so many charlatans emerge in these days. And the position of our country for many, many years has been self-regulation. Let the churches, let the religious bodies self-regulate. But it appears that that hasn't worked. And a lot of religious leaders themselves have voiced out this frustration. And the number of false prophets are increasing. We, we all see it on the screens. They are kicking pregnant women in the name of performing miracles. They are giving concoctions, and there's a public health crisis. Doctors are warning. They deny them access to health care. We need to maintain a balance between, between Article 21, 1C, freedom of religion and to manifest your religion, but also the state has a responsibility in Article 37 of the Constitution, Article 37, to be that the state shall enact appropriate laws to assure the protection and promotion of all other basic human rights and freedoms, including the rights of the disabled, the aged, children, and other vulnerable groups in development processes. Reading from your handy over notes, I realize at page 16 that in the often your predecessor began some discussions about a national policy on religion to help address some of these uh, threats and dangers to the health of our society. What is your view about all of these charlatans who are taking over our airwaves, uh, polluting, brainwashing people? And we've seen that it can be very dangerous. 
Pastor Wright, he, 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 he just burned down the whole congregation, killed people. It can, it can be really terrible. And we are getting there. What's your view on this matter? And how do you intend, through policy, to maintain this fine balance, freedom to, to manifest religion, but also in a responsible way that does not endanger uh, vulnerable uh, citizens? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's the, there's the need to have a balancing act between people professing religion and then some other people trampling upon the rights of these individuals who visit these churches. That is why my predecessor has started this policy on religion. As a ministry, when I'm giving the note, we cannot control or seek to register or regulate the churches. But what we can do is to create an enabling environment that would make the individuals who belong to these faiths practice their faith, not at the expense of any violations of their human rights. So when I'm giving the nod, we will follow up on the draft policy and hold some broader consultations with the religious bodies as a way of self-regulating themselves. Already, there are a few structures in place. So we must not allow a few bad notes in any profession to dent the hard-won reputation of those who are really doing well. Because in as much as they are charlatans, they are very good priests and very good pastors and very good religious institutions. So we have to act in such a way that we will not throw away the baby with the bad water. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my second question relates to the President's uh, pet project. He seems to be very fascinated about uh, giving this country a national cathedral. Is that project still a priority uh, in the midst of a pandemic and all the challenges that we are facing? Uh, what is the briefing you have received on the National Cathedral project. Is, is it alive and is it still a priority of priorities for the president, as he, he stated some time back, especially in the midst of this pandemic when we are looking for money for vaccines? The National Cathedral project is still a government priority project. The, His Excellency, the president, has indicated that that project is going to be constructed at very least cost to the states. I know that the Rich Church, for instance, has designated July and December of each year as days that they would do a special offertory to gather funds for the uh, purpose of the contributing to the construction of the National Cathedral. The, there was an action in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the establishment of the National Cathedral. And the Supreme Court uh, ruled against the petitioner who went to court. So it's on course and already the contractors are on site and work is ongoing. Thank you. By way of follow-up, do you know how much it will cost this country? What is the cost of the National Cathedral? I haven't received any briefing as to the uh, entire cost of the project yet. What I do know is that some seed money has been advanced for the construction of the cathedral. Thank you. $25 million. So $25 million has been, has been extended uh, as seed capital. Uh, yes, that's to my knowledge. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> my, my final question uh, will bring us to chieftaincy. Uh, do you have any latest report from the briefing you have received on the number of flashpoints that uh, we have as a country and how do you intend to resolve these matters expeditiously to bring a, a resolution? Because as you know, it can degenerate into a national security uh, crisis. So how many flashpoints do we have currently 
and what are the uh, expedited policies you have in, in mind uh, at the moment, if approved, uh, to address this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My predecessor inherited 325 chieftaincy disputes and was able to resolve 270 of them. Currently, there are 300 chieftaincy disputes that are pending. The issue of adjudication of these disputes, the issue of logistics, I spoke about them even before you came in, and the digitization of the entire adjudication process. These are ways that, when I'm approved, we put in place to ensure that these disputes are disposed of as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Finally, a uh, follow-up. Oh, finally. You have said your last. Uh, become yes, but uh, a Nobody need for a follow-up as a reason, but yes. I'll, I'll follow your future. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, in 2016, the Minister of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs conducted a research and based upon that, developed a strategic implementation plan to execute a project called Harmful Traditional Practices Project. What is the status of that project? And would you consider a single project that deals with Nemeka religious practices in Ghana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The briefing that I received so far points to the fact that these projects are ongoing. The issue about female genital mutilation, the issue about widowhood rights, and some other harmful practices. There is the need to involve the National Commission on Civic Education in this particular enterprise so that we can have a, a very good approach to the resolution of some of these harmful practices. Thank you. What about the second aspect of it? Looking at the inimical religious practices, I ask whether you consider a similar project to deal with that situation. Sorry, I didn't get the last bit of your question. The of the question was, would you consider a similar project that would deal with inimical religious practices? Um, our colleague, Honorable Okujeto, made reference to some of these things in his last question. And in my answer, I said that these are issues that we need to deal with. Thank you. Now, my second question is about chiefs as development agents. Our chiefs have been development agents since pre-colonial times. And still, we expect them to lead the development agenda of their communities. In fact, one of the charges usually preferred against chiefs for these two men is their inability to deliver development in their communities. Between, between tradition and modernity, what should be the specific role of these chiefs in delivering development in their communities, and how are they empowered to be able to do that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The role of chiefs in development in their various traditional areas cannot be downplayed. Indeed, some of the hospitals and schools that we have in this country was as a result of some of our chiefs giving our lands and encouraging some other people to uh, invest in these areas, in their various traditional areas. The way and manner in which the uh, royalties are distributed, some funds are given to the district assemblies and some chiefs for the maintaining the status of those traditional areas and the schools. So we cannot delink the chief's role as a development agent in his traditional area from his core functions as the chief of the community. So that blame should necessarily exist. Thank you.
The Chieftaincy Act and its regulations are solid on the criteria for the elevation of divisional chiefs to the status of paramountcy. What do you think must be done to ensure uniformity in terms of criteria so that we can upgrade divisional chiefs with a known process other than anything that uh, comes into mind? What do you think must be done? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The elevation of chiefs or divisional chiefs to paramonesis is based on a number of factors. Uh, the institution of chieftaincy, fortunately, are masters of their own rules. When I'm giving the nod, with the kind of collaboration that will be taking place between the ministry and the national house of chiefs and the regional house of chiefs, you can develop a blueprint to, to ensure that uh, there are standards for doing some of these things. But we have to take note of the fact that the various traditional areas have various rules governing who becomes what. So we have to have that kind of collaboration and understanding so that we cannot have one standard rule that will be applicable to all the traditional areas that we have in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, I insisted that today being Friday, we want to close early. So I will insist on the six on each side. But, so can you let me come to leadership? One. Now you are the available leader, right? So Honorable, I will uh, count you out today. Yes, because I've done six already. Uh, available leader. Sorry? Uh, is that you, you are forgoing the available leader one? So if you are forgoing that, I'll give it to him. <laughs> is there one question, please? Mr. Chairman, I can only but be grateful for the opportunity, even though I wish you could at least make it two for me, because it is taking me by surprise, and I have to drop some of the questions that I prepared to ask. So please, Mr. Chairman, with Honorable your permission. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Honorable nominee, my first question has to do with your relationship with maybe one will say chiefs or the traditional authority um, in the area that you have operated as member of parliament before. I'm sure you do recall that um, chiefs of the Hunter West had cause to uh, invoke curses on you. Um, the upper, is it Discov or Discov Bay, you know, traditional area, called on their ancestors and their gods to deal with you for insulting the paramount chief of the area, Obrimpong Imaduchi the 14. Um, based on this, how do you assure this committee and this nation that you have what it takes to deal with chiefs across the country as the minister responsible for that sector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am a prince. My father was a chief. So I should be the last person who insults any chief. It is never correct that I insulted any chief. Some members of our party went overboard in some of the comments that they made. That issue has long been resolved. Indeed, when my nomination came, the upper disco chief was one of the persons I went to officially inform him about my nomination by the president. He congratulated me and gave his blessings for my nomination. Thank you. Right. Um, 
Mr. Chairman, I'd like the nominee to also take a very good look at these pictures. Um, I'll explain, you will not understand now. Um, these are pictures from the northern region, House of Chiefs, northern region House of Chiefs. Currently, they, as you can see, work from under a tree. That's the northern region House of Chiefs. They work from under a tree. And this is because the facility that they originally worked from was put under renovation in 2019. And work on that project has since stopped, making it very difficult for the work of the authority to go. So on behalf of the people of Dabon and all the chiefs in Northern Region, I want to know if you have been briefed on the state of this renovation and how soon work on it will be concluded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My briefing indicated that there, there are some work going on in some of the regional House of Chiefs. And uh, we are also very certain in our minds that they are preparing the 2021 budget. The bane of the ministry has been lack of funds, adequate funds uh, for capital uh, investment in the area. And I believe that uh, when the budget statement comes before this honorable house, Honorable colleagues would uh, put in a plea for the ministry so that the budgetary allocation is enhanced so that some of these projects that you are talking about can be uh, completed as soon as possible. Thank you. So you can't assure the committee how soon this project will be uh, complete? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I need to uh, know what provision has been made or is going to be made in the 2021 budget so that I can speak affirmatively on this particular project. But we have my assurance that... Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, but whatever are you is, suggesting there was no budgetary allocation before the contract was awarded? Is that the case? I, I haven't said so. I have stated that there are a number of ongoing projects. As and when funds are released, these projects are continued. But I'm giving you the assurance that when I'm giving the note, I will expedite action on this particular one, which you brought to my attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, Reverend, you have said one dead one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations, Honorable Nominee. I must congratulate you um, for the sound position that you have indicated on pertinent issues of chieftaincy and religion, and I must indicate my satisfaction and confidence that with these inclinations that you have given, there's no doubt that you would leave legacies at this ministry. On this note, I congratulate you. Unless you should have, you could have done behind us. Wait, now I'm coming to leadership, but the leaders are here now. So I didn't ask because I didn't ask because it was assumed that I'll be leadership. Now, the leader has come, and then uh -huh. I still don't get the opportunity. You have taken leadership uh, oh. opportunity oh. a couple of times. Please. I'll give you one. One. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I have one Hydra-headed question. <laughs> one Hydra-headed question. It has to do with the... role of chiefs in development uh, and then also the witches camp the witches camp the witches camp that we have in northeast region and article 272 c of the constitution it deals with the role of the national house of chiefs
to identify harmful cultural practices, traditions, and etc., and have them outlawed. You've seen that, yes. So, as a minister responsible for chieftaincy, if you get the nod, how, what, what are you going to do, and how are you going to guarantee us that by the end of your tenure, you will get the National House of Chiefs to clamp down on, on such an institution uh, and, and have it abolished and, and the practice stopped. And also uh, the role of chiefs in development, especially in the era of spatial planning, uh, land use, uh, management of development at the local level, chiefs really have greater capacity and influence in, in, in the communities. This whole thing about land guards and etc. There's definitely a correlation between their desire to control the lands under their, their, their jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis, uh, state law enforcement mechanism for controlling land development. How are you going to make them more responsible in the management and development of land where people just take lands, develop them, no access rules, no planning, nothing. People just build because the chief has given the lands uh, to them. So if you can combine these and generally provide some response, given the restrictions I'm under. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The collaboration that I have to establish with the National House of Chiefs to ensure that some of these harmful practices are dealt with, the law is provision for that. So when giving the note, I'll pursue that part. The issue about the special planning and chiefs as agents of development in their various traditional areas have indicated that they are already doing it. The setback has been that sometimes the chiefs will be in their various traditional areas and people will come in there to say that I have a concession, I have a permit to come and do A, B, C. So if right from the onset these chiefs are involved in the entire planning process, I think these issues will be resolved. So there's a need for uh, closer collaboration and involvement at the initial stages of some of these developmental projects, and I'll pursue that part when I'm giving them. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out from the nominee in answering the question about uh, the cost of the construction of the cathedral. He said what he knows is that 25 million U.S. dollars has been extended as seed money, right? He said 25 million dollars has been extended as seed money. Yes, that is correct. But you don't know the total cost of the project? I don't have any information to that effect. Come again? I don't have any information to that effect here. Uh, but when they were giving their briefing, you didn't ask when they were telling me about the 25 million as the seed money, I thought that would have been an obvious question that should follow. What is the anticipated amount that will be used to complete it? The National Cathedral is actually not under my ministry. I only did a preemptive strike by anticipating that it was a likely question to come. That's why I did some reading on my own about it. But the National Cathedral is not under the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Yeah, Service. I know, because uh, you know, it has to do with uh, religious activities. So maybe that's why you, on your own, try to find some information on it. But did you find out the cause of the demolition? The, the judges' homes, the passport office, those demolitions, have, have you asked about the estimated cost of the demolition? Mr. Chairman, I don't have any idea about that cost. Thank you. The chairman, he was just answering or making his comment about the Special Planning Act. And one of the major problems that you have, especially in the urban centers, when chiefs have sent their uh, schemes and it's been approved, where they made provision for all the necessary amenities, roads, schools, recreational centers, and what have you. Once the place starts developing, then on their own, they start agitating for rezoning and um, completely missing the, the scheme, very scheme that they have done. I know that not even this house 
has been mandated by our constitution to to amend at that affect chieftaincy. But this action of our chiefs, how do you hope to get them to uh, comply with the Special Planning Act? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once there is closer collaboration between the traditional leaders, the municipal, metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies, and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, there should be a way out of resolving some of these issues. Because once you give out the land, and then the developments catch up with it, there should be a way of ensuring that the purpose for which these lands were reserved are adhered to. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, there is this uh, erroneous impression that is uh, being banded around by our chiefs that, oh, we gave this land for you to construct parliament. Now that you are not using it for parliament, reverse it to us. And But there's a Supreme Court ruling that says that once that land is going to be used for the public good, it does not necessarily have to be reverted to them. How do you hope to get them to appreciate this so that they may stop the unnecessary litigation that in many disassemblies is one of the major challenges they have with the traditional authorities? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a need for some education and some further engagement with these traditional leaders so that they appreciate some of the concerns that you have raised. And when I'm giving the note, we will continue along that path. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the Special Planning Act, precisely Section 93, 3 and 4, it's talking about when rezoning had to be done. Because of the way the, uh, for lack of a better word, the Nananum or the Paramount Chiefs or the Chiefs and the District Assembly are abusing the rezoning and virtually messing up the scheme. When we were passing this act in 2016, Parliament said that if you needed to rezone land that is used or reserved for the public use, you have to come to Parliament. This is not really popularized, and you still get a lot of assemblies and Nananum uh, chiefs go around rezoning without coming to Parliament. How do you hope to popularize this for them to appreciate that if it has to be done, then it must necessarily come to Parliament to comply with the Act? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the once there is a law in existence regulating how some of these things ought to be done, I think the laws ought to be followed. Thank you. I don't know whether you were given a briefing on the cost of pilgrimages, both the Muslim and the Christians. You know, recent, recent past, the, the Minister of Chieftaincy has been facilitating the pilgrims to uh, Jerusalem. And then the government will have been supporting, in one way or the other, the Muslim to be able to embark on the pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. I don't know whether in the briefing you, you asked about the, how much it's been costing us annually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I haven't received any such briefing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, in your constituency, the, you pulled down a dilapidated youth center and promised to construct a stadium to replace it. Is that correct? It's, uh, I In think your it's, own constituency, yeah. you pulled down a dilapidated youth center with the hope of replacing it with a stadium, with a promise that you are going to construct a stadium in its place. Is that correct? That is not correct. I have not pulled down a dilapidated youth center to construct a stadium in my constituency. Also, oh, since you became a member of Parliament Trans Seventy, you have not made an attempt to pull down any youth center in your constituency. I'm saying that I have not pulled down any youth center. What I'm doing in my constituency is rather constructing a youth center in my constituency from the uh, funds that are available to MPs. When did you start the, that construction? When did that construction start? When did you, when did you start 
the construction? The construction started sometime in 2018. 2018. Is it completed? Sajama is not completed. About what percentage completion? I would say that they are now at the footing stage. Footing stage, completed the footings. Mr. Chairman, the customary land secretary that is within the Land Act is to support land management by, by the Land Commission. What do you intend to do if given the opportunity, knowing that you are in charge of Chief Chancy and customary force director are due to improve that secretary? I'm know. talking about the, the customary the land secretary. You know, because we are in charge of chief tenancy, and you know, normally these ones falls under our chiefs. And you know, they have a variety of challenges. And I'm saying that when given the load, what do you intend to do to improve the services and uh, the challenges that the customary land secretaries is facing to be able to help our chiefs and traditional authorities? The Secretariat is not under the ministry. The Secretariat is under the uh, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. I have indicated that there should be closer collaboration between my ministry and that ministry so that where payments are due, the chiefs, these payments are done promptly so that they can use those monies. Those royalties or those portions of those monies that ought to come to the chiefs are received as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, I should thank you and to wish our colleague, the Honorable Kum, uh, well, and to urge him that the President is taking him to a very sensitive institution, the Chieftaincy Institution with additional responsibility for religion. There are emotive issues there, so you have to be reflective and sober and work in accordance with Chapter 22 of the Constitution. Chairman relates to me that you've already been referred to Article 270 and 272. You see that customary law and customary usage is part of our practice and within the meaning of Article 11 of the Constitution. On this lesbianism gay, where do you stand as a good Christian? Where do you stand? If it's been yeah, answered, them, uh, 10 questions on them. On them. Oh, now, Chairman, uh, Section 63D Honorable Muntaka, help me with the Chieftaincy Act so that I quote it for my purposes. <laughs> Chairman, I'm referencing Nana Ajay Ampofo versus National House of Chiefs and the Attorney General reported 2011 a Supreme Court decision where Section 63D was held by the court. Supreme Court as unconstitutional uh, and then I just read the section 63 for our purposes a person who acts or performs the functions of, chief, of a chief when that person is not qualified to act and as I've said I'm emphasizing 63D deliberately refuses to honor a call from a chief to attend to an issue. The Supreme Court is of the view that this is unconstitutional. It reminds me of my first year tutorial in sociology and anthropology at the University of Ghana, I believe by Professor Nukunya and Chris Abuchi. And it was a popular question. Quita away the chieftaincy institution. It was a very popular sociological question for first year students. Chiefs used to exercise legislative powers. They used to exercise judicial powers, even 
religious powers. But modernization has taken it over. Now, the Supreme Court thinks that a chief has no power to invite a person. The National House of Chiefs, led by Tukbe Afede, engaged myself and the Honorable Oseiche Mensa Bonsu with the Office of the Attorney General. So it requires an amendment. Will you lead the process to make sure that we domesticate by law what has become a decision of the Supreme Court? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will support whatever collaboration the National House of Chiefs will need to effect the amendment that will give meaning to the true intent of that provision, which has been shot down by the Supreme Court of this country. Thank you. Chairman, just noting further, I have some understanding from the uh, former president of the National House of Chiefs, to be further that there is some discussion and understanding with the Attorney General Office to improve the text. But ultimately, it will need to come to Parliament for us to legislate on it. Can you give us timelines when this can be done? When I'm giving the note, I would work on it expeditiously. I cannot give timelines because of the processes that involve, most of which I don't have control over. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, so it brings to fore the debate of modernity versus traditionalism. In my part of the country, for instance, and I believe even in the Ashanti Kingdom, uh, who dare you not respond to a call from uh, His Majesty uh, Otunfu Azentehine? Who dare you not to respond to a call from uh, the Pada Pio or the uh, Sandema Paramosi? But it means that at 759 of 2008, appreciated that chiefs could do this, and in fact provided that if you refuse to respond to a call to, by a chief, you commit an offense and you are liable to summary conviction to a fine not more than 200 penalty units. How do you marry this delicate balance of chief exercising legitimate authority for the peace and stability of their community and their country Against this, it's my right, it's my right, it's my human right. What will you do as minister on that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that the Supreme Court in its ruling indicated that to attend to an issue was at large. So what kind of interpretation to put on what the issue was, was in controversy. So moving on, once there's the intention to re recraft that particular provision, whatever it takes for us to ensure that it gets the true intent of what the House of Chiefs wants and so that the, they can have the power to adjudicate on those matters that are in contention. We will pursue that part. Thank you very much. Chairman, my is just to end with a comment again. Sensitive area, that bomb. The President has done his best to resolve aspects of it. It is not complete yet. There are still threats to the institution. There are problems in Nantong, problems in Karga, Nanu. The uh, paramountcy of the Bimbila, Nanuba traditional area, there are issues. And is the wish of the Regent and the other parties in the dispute over there that there is a Supreme Court decision on it similar to Rihanna, which helped guide the Dagbaum process. I want to trust that you will guide the President with deep thought in, appreciation, in appreciating what the Honorable Ablaqua referred to you, that there are still major, major flat points in the country. In fact, in my constituency this morning, several people have been arrested to the police station from a community known as Young Dakyamile. We started from Monday up to ye yesterday. And Mr. Chairman, to interest you, sons of the same father have disagreed on who should succeed. And that has resulted in the destruction of property. So that's why I'm saying that you have to be level-headed 
in order to assist the president to deal uh, with, 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 with this delicate uh, institution. Once you are a member of parliament, uh, I wish you well. Thank you, Chairman. Very well. Honourable Member Nominee, you appear to have had a substantial engagement with the Centre for National Culture. 2000 to 2005, 92 to 96, then 86 to 87. All these periods were, apart from indicating that you did national service with them, you didn't indicate what we were doing there on your CV. 1992 to 96, what were you doing at the National Centre for National Culture in Second D? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was the Assistant Public Relations Officer for the uh, Center for National Culture before, from uh, 92 to 96. And then from 2000 to 2005, I was responsible for administration. Thank you. Well, my next issue is the religious affairs. Do you think that we should draw up some regulation to regulate or provide for some constitutional arrangement, just like you have a model constitution for companies? you think it, it will be practicable to have some model regulation for religious organization so that we can have them operate within certain limits. What's your view? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with you to the extent that because there are various sects, it has to be done taking cognizance of the various religious beliefs that the individual has professed to. Thank you. Very well. We thank you for attending upon the House to answer questions. You will hear from us later. But for now, you are discharged. I'm very grateful, Mr. Chairman.
clearly indicates how to minimize the risk of contracting COVID-19. Unfortunately, a lot of people are still ignoring to adhere to these measures, in particular to wear masks properly in public spaces. We would like to support the government of Ghana to sensitize citizens on the risks involved and how to protect themselves, their families, friends, and communities. Risk communication is having a significant impact on the behavior of people. Wearing masks, keeping the right distance, following hygiene measures will avoid further transmission of COVID-19. Misinformation, on the other hand, can lead to disregarding regarding protective measures and subsequently taking the risk to get infected. With our risk communication campaign, we would like to contribute to the dissemination of the right information across the country. At the same time, we expect which leads to stigmatization of those ones who are sick with COVID-19. This again can lead to people trying to hide their infection because they do not want to be exposed. But they should quarantine and inform those ones um, they have been in contact uh, with to avoid further transmission. If this is not done consequently, the spread cannot be stopped. That's why it was important for us to address stigmatization in our campaign as well. As the name of our program says, Government Development, we pay specific attention to the aspect of inclusion. Therefore, we wanted to direct our support to those ones who have challenges in accessing information. Blind people are often exploring their environment by touching items. Hygiene measures are of particular importance to them. Further, the concept of social distancing will be difficult to follow for visually impaired. We develop descriptive jingles for them on Bluetooth devices which are shared among blind people. Trainings are currently provided to visually and hearing impaired and their caregivers. Apart from risk communication, the Governance for Inclusive Development Program is also involved in other support measures. The provision of personal protective equipment to revenue collectors of 100 MMDAs across the country. Let me emphasize that the entire equipment was locally produced and includes face masks, soaps, sanitizers, and hand washing stations. The revenue collectors will also play a part in the sensitization of the citizens and distribute these leaflets. I think you all got a version of this. Last year, in August, we set up an eight-bed intensive care unit, including ventilators in Takoradi at the Afia Gnanfa Hospital. Further measures are planned, such as provision of boreholes in regional coordinating councils to improve access to water. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the program manager of the Governance for Inclusive Development program. It still feels strange to me to be so active in the health sector. Usually, we provide support to the government of Ghana in mobilization of domestic revenues, accountability, and public financial management. However, when the situation changes, it is our task to adapt. Distinguished guests and representatives of the media, we have come a long way from the first idea to contribute to improved risk communication until the launch event today. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Ghana Health Service, and in particular, the Health Promotion Division, Dr. Da Costa, and his team for their valuable inputs, their engagement in testing the materials across the country, and now also the involvement in the trainings. I would like to thank the Ghana Blind Union and the Ghana National Association of the Deaf for their great cooperation. And I would like to thank our consultant, Ms. Cecilia Seno from Hope for Future Generation, and her team for their ideas, inputs, and the organization of the whole process. I would also like to thank my team for making the whole campaign and today's event possible. They have worked day and night, weekends, on, and so on, to be where we are today. Thank you also to our donor, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, for making the necessary funds available, which allows us to provide this support. I wish 
that we can make a difference with this campaign. Stay healthy and mask up Ghana. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. Shall we give him another round of applause? GIZ is very particular about inclusion, and so this program on COVID-19 is focusing a lot on vulnerable population. And so we've been working with the persons with the deaf, GNAD, and then the blind. We are so grateful, GBU, for your support. I will immediately call on a, a statement from GNAD to deliver their short statement in support of this program. Thank you very much. We invite them to the podium. Okay. So maybe you will talk while. First and foremost, on behalf of the Ghana National Association of the Deaf, we want to thank you all, especially for GID, for wonderful support in terms of inclusion. At this important time when you are dealing with COVID-19. Currently, we started the project in various districts of Ghana. Now we are making a lot of more people aware of what COVID-19 is and the various measures they have to take to protect themselves. We are very grateful to you and your support. Second, we are grateful to Ghana government for their support and GID as well. If not for their support, we will not be able to do these projects. We thank you for that. Lastly, We also thank you for the PPE that you supply to us. Our members have received them, the nose masks and the other materials. We are really grateful and we hope that we will continue to have cooperation in terms of fighting against COVID-19. Thank you all. Shall we thank them again for the special message, appreciating all that GIZ has done, the provision, the training, and also Ghana government for supporting them. Indeed, it's important this time to include them in whatever we are doing. Thank you very much. I will invite GBU also to the podium to talk. They are actually partners for this particular project across the 100 districts and 16 regions of Ghana with Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service. Thank you. All protocol duly observed. Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Secretary Director of Ghana Blind Union, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the GIZ and the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service, and Hope for Future Generation. For us at GBU, COVID means not living because we have come to understand that COVID means 
do not get closer to people or you'll be infected. It also means do not touch things or you'll be infected. In other words, COVID means for us as visually impaired people, we should not interact. And in other words, we shouldn't see because we see with our hands. So we are very grateful for this project because when COVID first came, the education was mostly on social media and was through visual content. Most of the members of Ghana Blind Union did not get access to information regarding preventing themselves from getting COVID. But through this project, a lot of trainings have gone on, especially in different languages for the majority of our members who can hardly use social media content or speak our traditional English. Information has gone down to the very rural areas, helping them understand how they should wash their hands, how to wear their masks, and how to socially distance. Further, I would like to add that this information should go a long way to help the assistance and the caregivers of persons with visual impairment. Because we are more vulnerable if our caregivers do not understand how to protect themselves. They invariably infect us as persons with visual impairment. One last thing I'd like to add is that we are very excited as Ghana Blind Union that the vaccines have arrived. We are very, very excited because of which UK was part. Um, in their own view, if 
they were exiting from the EU, then the principle of continuity uh, ought uh, to be invoked, meaning that the provisions that um, were underpinning the agreement between Ghana and the EU should now be applied between Ghana and the UK. And we had a major disagreement with that position of the UK. I mean, we recognize that having exited from the EU, the UK had a major challenge to negotiate trade, individual trade agreements with every country that the EU had a relationship with. So we, un we understood the challenge that they had, and that was why they were using this continuity uh, principle. But the reason why we disagreed with the principle of continuity was that the EU-Ghana agreement that I've just referred to, it's inconsistent with the provisions of the customs union of ECOWAS. Technically speaking, we are now a member of the ECOWAS Customs Union. And if you're a member of the ECOWAS Customs Union, you have no flexibility to negotiate outside the Customs Union without the concurrence of the Customs Union. And the same thing that applied to the UK. When the UK was part of the EU, they had absolutely no authority to negotiate outside the EU. So our position was that if we now have to sign an agreement uh, with the UK, then it has to be consistent with the provisions of the ECOWAS Customs Union. And we, went, we went back and forth for almost a year um, at the level of technical consultations until December 2020 when the UK was just about to exit and we wanted to avoid a trade disruption uh, between Ghana and the UK. So I decided to escalate the discussions to a higher political level uh, to see whether there could be a breakthrough because we were proposing that we use an, or, an, an original text of a regional economic partnership agreement that had been signed between the EU and then ECOWAS. We felt that that regional text should be the basis for the text of the agreement between Ghana and the UK, so that it will be consistent with the requirements of our customs union. So when um, I escalated the negotiations to the level of my counterpart, uh, the right on our goal is Strauss, um, in, in December, uh, the last week of December. Um, she graciously agreed that as an exception to their uh, principle of continuity, they would accept our position to use the text of the Regional Economic Partnership Agreement uh, as the basis for the new bilateral Ghana-UK agreement, so that um, once it enters into force, then it would not be difficult to convince ECOWAS uh, to also adopt that. So Chairman. basically, uh, where we are now, uh, the President has given executive approval for the agreement. Uh, we've uh, forwarded the agreement to Parliament the, um, the uh, UK government has signaled that on the 2nd of March, both countries will sign the new Ghana-UK agreement, and then it will enter into force, hopefully, on the 5th of March. So that's where we are. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. The bane of every finance minister in Ghana from independence to yesterday is the problem of uh, imports outweighing exports, particularly rice and sugar. And rice in the sense that 
we have comparative advantage to produce it. We are spending close to 1 billion US dollars in importing just these two commodities annually. That affects our balance of payment, that affects the exchange rate and the stability of the city. As a minister responsible for the economy, what plans do you have to expand our exports and to reduce our imports? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, uh, I did not uh, intend to create a problem for our President. Um, I thought I had the Honourable Minority Leader uh, talk about me being responsible for the economy. Uh, if I had you right, then... Um, responsible for trade and industry. Thank you. Thank um, you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't say finance. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, you are absolutely right. Uh, there's a major problem that has confronted uh, this country uh, for decades, for over a century, in terms of the number of products that we import into our country which could be produced uh, locally. And as the Honorable Member of Parliament, uh, of, uh, the Minority Leader indicated, currently between these three commodities, sugar, rice, and then poultry, um, we are, we are in almost uh, close to uh, one billion dollars uh, of imports uh, for for absolutely no reason, because we have the local capacity to be able to do import substitution and uh, produce uh, these commodities. But this underpins the decision of His Excellency the President uh, for Ghana to launch a comprehensive program for industrial transformation which my ministry has been leading. And basically, uh, this transformation uh, program is anchored on two parallel tracks. Uh, first, to ensure that we produce to export, and secondly, also, that we produce uh, for, the, for the purposes of uh, import substitution. And so, uh, we have very comprehensive interventions that um, we have put in place, and I'm sure uh, as we go uh, on in this uh, exercise, uh, these matters will come up. Very com comprehensive transformational interventions that is building the capacity of local businesses uh, to be able to uh, import substitute and also uh, even produce these uh, products for for exports. So um, we are already on the right path, uh, and that's the basis for our uh, industrial transformation agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman, thank you. Honorable nominee responsible for trade and industry, you are largely responsible for the implementation of the present flagship initiative. 1D, 1F, one district, one factory, which for all intents and purposes is intended to provide opportunities for many people and to lead our effort in industrialization. Can you provide us how many so far and give a regional background in the Upper East, Upper West through the 16 regions how many 1D, 1F have you been able to initiate and where and the status of it? Thank you, Chair. Chairman, um, Mr. Chairman, um, again, I think it is appropriate for me to indicate that the one district, one factory initiative, which has been led by uh, the Minister of Trade and Industry, is one of the most 
revolutionary interventions uh, to have been introduced in our country since independence. It goes to the core of bringing industry and development to the doorstep of the ordinary people. And, uh, and that is why uh, we've uh, pursued with uh, aggression uh, this whole program of one district, one factory. Currently, we have 232 1D1F 1D, 1D projects that are at various stages of implementation. And contrary to some of the comments that have been made, that 1D1F is uh, an attempt just to brush up existing uh, companies. Uh, indeed, was the program implementation uh, framework allows for existing companies to be one to one of companies. But if you look at the statistics, out of the 232 companies, only 64 are existing companies and 168 are new companies. Now, um, the breakdown is as follows. Projects currently operating as 1D1F is 76. Projects under construction is 107. And then um, projects ready to commence construction within uh, the first half of this year um, is 49. And um, so far, uh, out of the 232 projects, 56% uh, are agro-processing projects, 22% uh, general manufacturing, 5% meat processing, uh, primary agriculture is 4%, and there are other industrial enterprises which constitute 13%. Um, through uh, the intervention of the 1B1F, uh, 139,331 direct and indirect jobs um, have been created by the same business companies that are already operational. 285,915 additional direct and indirect jobs are projected from the uh, projects that are under construction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, through this initiative, we've been able to mobilize 2.3 billion Ghana cities from uh, local financial institutions. Uh, government has provided interest subsidy payment to support 213, uh, or two, uh, interest subsidy support of 213 million Ghana cities. This is meant to de-risk uh, the project for the banks uh, because the interest subsidy then makes it uh, easier for them to become more profitable. And in addition to that, 603 million import duty exemptions have been granted uh, to 37 1B1F companies having come through this honorable uh, house. Uh, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, I do not have with me the regional background, but this is the status. So can you speak with certainty that as revolutionary as you describe it, it's in the Upper West region as in the Upper East region. Can you speak with certainty? There are one D initiatives in Borga, Navrungu, Zebla, or any part of it, or in the Upper West uh, region, uh, whether Lambuse or Tumu or where, 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 in these two regions, I want to know whether the revolution have gotten there. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I indicated, I do not have the uh, regional breakdown with me, uh, and I think uh, before this honorable house, it is Chama will be he came, that uh, I give accurate information. Chama, we know that the last time he came to Parliament, the Upper West Region did not benefit from it. There was one in the Upper East Region, and our follow-up, there is no significant development in it. But let me now take you to another area. After you've done well with the President, which was initiated by late President Mills, this Free African Continental Trade Agreement, which is headquartered now in Ghana. Now, trade liberalization, particularly, I'm going to use Nigeria as a case study. 
Don't go to cement. It's in Ghana. Simav, Moroccan, is in Ghana. Many Ghanaian entrepreneurs cannot break through the Nigerian market. And you are aware that there is what the Nigerians call the prohibited list of imports from Ghana into Nigeria. I know in the last couple of months you've been trying to manage the problems associated with the GIPC limitation even for retail trading within our country by foreigners and in particular Nigerians, which almost led to some diplomatic problems between our two countries. Now, Jata cement is local. There is a local Ghanaian who is doing well to produce uh, cement. What will you do to improve the competitiveness of the Ghanaian entrepreneur to match with their counterparts in Nigeria and beyond? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I indicated earlier on that to a large extent, under the leadership of our President and also under my own leadership leading the Ministry, we've been ahead of the coming into force of the AFCFT. Because if time permits, and I go through some of the industrial uh, initiatives that we've been uh, implementing in the last four years. The question that has been put by the uh, Honorable Minority Leader uh, is answered by the decision that we are taking ahead of the after to introduce in initiatives that will enhance the local capacity of our businesses, preparing them to be able to export not only to ECOWAS, but uh, to the wider African market. Um, I don't want to just uh, dwell on the 1D1F, but the 1D1F is a major intervention that would enable our companies to be able to produce to uh, mix the requirements of after. But beyond that, as I said, there are other interventions uh, which are already in place. But in addition to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, specifically following the uh, start of uh, trading, we've already initiated a national program of action to identify different categories of Ghanaian companies that we would support to take advantage of AFTA. Um, one category are companies that are already exporting uh, to Africa. So these are low hanging fruits. So uh, we are distilling information on these existing companies. All we are doing is to make sure that we enhance their capacity to be able to sell more. Then there's another category of companies that are exporting currently, but not necessarily uh, to Africa. So it means that they have the capacity to export. And so we are also helping them to identify specific products uh, that they can uh, now produce to export to the African market. And obviously also new companies that we can incubate uh, specifically to target uh, after. So there's a lot that is already going on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, that's appreciated. I'll take the nominee to the manufacturing sector of Ghana was his contribution to our GDP. But I want you to respond relative to a lopsided industrial development in Ghana beyond Tema and Accra and little portions of Ashanti region. And Chairman, we all can use it as an example. When it's 4.30 p.m. to 5.30, you see in the industrial area, maybe North Kaneshi, large army of young people come out heading home. It means they've had a job to do and they have earned an income. Beyond Accra and Tema, 
I don't see that anywhere in the brown half region. I don't see that in the northern region, in the upper east, upper west region. And my faith is that this is how we can address the unemployment challenge. And probably you must have some thinking on light manufacturing, the light, light manufacturing industry. What plans do you have for that to address the growing unemployment in our country? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, even at the risk of sounding repetitive, I think it is important that I go back to the point that um, that the government has already embarked on this very comprehensive program for industrial transformation. And I agree completely uh, with the Honorable Member that currently, beyond Accra and Kumasi, you, there is little evidence of significant industrial activity. But that's the whole point about having a program that decentralizes industrial development, uh, about the 1D1F in particular. But it also goes beyond uh, the 1D1F, recognizing that the 1D1F typically may be medium-sized companies. We have also embark on a program to support micro and small enterprises. And so as I speak now, we have established 67 business resource centers that will cover all the districts in Ghana. And these business resource centers, 37 of them are already operational and the other 30 um, will be completed again by the middle of this year. Now, these BRCs or business resource centers are one-stop enterprise support centers that are supposed to deliver business uh, development services to uh, uh, micro small enterprises throughout the country so that what the honorable member is referring to will become a thing of the past. So, if you are in uh, maybe Tamale, uh, South is, uh, uh, it is it's developed to the extent that we cannot necessarily put them in this category. But if you are in Bukugu or any other part of um, uh, the uh, northern uh, regions or in Ashanti or in the western north, any part of the country, now you have the opportunity to go to a business resource center uh, that will provide you with a full complement of services to enable you either start your business or enhance the capacity of your current uh, uh, enterprise activity. So basically, um, what you're asking for, honorable uh, member, is exactly what these business resource centers are doing. Chairman, I want to just, uh, for now, integrated customs management system. And you know, at the policy and institutional level, I support you that trade facilitation is not a function of finance or the Ministry of Finance. I think that under our WTO obligations and protocols, you should be leading matters of trade facilitation. The transition from GCNet to Unipass is likely to occasion a judgment debt for the country because GCNet was really providing those services, probably ably. Uh, I've had some discrepancies in terms of numbers. How is revenue faring and how the revenue fare under the GCNet? You want to explain the circumstances that led to the termination of the GCNet agreement, which is likely to visit a judgment debt on our country. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, before I proceed to answer, I respectfully um, uh, have a different opinion from the minority leader about uh, the fact that uh, what uh, we put in place as a new trade facilitation system um, is going to incur 
judgment date. But uh, let me give a little bit of a background to this. Um, without doubt, trade is the engine of growth for every country. And this explains why the most powerful economies of the world also happen to be the most powerful trading nations. So there is no debate about the value of trade. Now, when you talk about trade, then it's the facilitation of trade, the systems and processes that you put uh, uh, down in your country that allows trade to move on easily, freely, both import and export. Now, if you look at our trade facilitation space, over the last decades, four decades, since uh, import licenses were abolished in the 70s, this space of import-export has been characterized by a multiplicity of service providers, which I describe as a spaghetti bowl of service providers. You have so many uh, companies that are providing different types of services, very often not uh, fully integrated and coordinated with each other. This, regrettably, has been one of the major reasons why there have been leakages in our trade facilitation landscape, and then, by extension, also our revenue mobilization uh, space. And when we took office in 2017, and remember, uh, uh, my, uh, I think we are in the same club, you know, uh, trade ministers. I had been there before, and so I know about GCNET, and I knew about the destination inspection companies. But I was surprised to find out when I took office uh, in 2017 that this multiplicity of service providers still existed. And in addition to GCNet and West Blue, you had four others bringing the total to six service providers who, who were providing uh, different types of services. Now, the fact that these service providers are using digital platforms that do not speak to each other. Obviously, it cannot uh, generate maximum operational efficiency. And so I took uh, a bold decision that we needed for once in our country to put in place a comprehensive, fully integrated, end-to-end -end trade facilitation system that will do a number of things. Provide operational efficiency for imports and for exports. Secondly, to enhance revenue mobilization. Also, deep deepen our security arrangements uh, for both exports and then imports. And um, so we went through the uh, public procurement process and then uh, we selected a company um, that is a local company, but that is working together with the Korean Customs Service to deploy a new technology called Unipass. And in spite of all the noise and the uh, negative uh, comments about this bold effort that uh, we took, the statistics now is clear about the value of this new intervention. And I, with your indulgence, I'll just give you uh, just a, a, a few uh, numbers. Now, the Unipass, or the Ghana uh, uh, rendition of it, which is called ICOMS, Integrated Customs Management System. Now, this ICOMS was fully deployed in June 2020 when a lot, a lot of noise was being made. Now, in July, that's after only uh, one You mean controversy? You mean controversies are surrounding the, the change in initiative? Yes. Correct. Yes. 
You were saying noise. I, I thought you wanted controversy to better fit the situation. Oh, okay. 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 Yes, Thank controversy surrounding the production yes, of the universe. Chairman, so that the nominee is not equating public protest and legitimate civil society concerns as noise. That's what the deputy leader wants to him to avert his mind to. Okay. But, but once at it there, is there an action for judgment debt? Is it the case that government owes West Blue for non-payment of its services? Thank uh, you, Chair. Respectfully, uh, Honorable Leader, I think um, it is appropriate that I put it in the right context. So I'm saying that after the first month of deployment in July, there was an increase of 23% over the previous year, 2019. This is against the background that we were in the heart of the COVID uh, ex experience, which obviously then meant that there was a lot of trade disruption. In the second month in August, there was a 31% increase. In September, 34%. In October, 34%. In November, 25%. In December, 19%. So, Mr. Chairman, how is it that a system that had been described in uh, very negative terms could, upon deployment, immediately increase our revenue mobilization to start? It's never happened in this country before. Minister, it's think, not about increases in volumes of trade and volumes of what was imported. No, it's, uh, it's a, you know, is a function of CIF, many of it. I'm saying that one 2019, just to, for you to take note, there was no COVID in 2019. So you probably will be referring to 2020 figures. But I get your percentages, 23, 31, 34 percent. But I'm saying that couldn't it be a function of volumes? Uh, um, uh, respectfully, uh, Minority Leader, COVID was in 2020. And I'm suggesting to you that with the decrease in the volume of trade, you could not expect logically that you would have increased volumes and by extension, increased value. This is, I think, uh, uh, logic. So the 29, 2019 figures I'm referring to is a basis for comparing the deployment of the system in 2020 as against 2019 where you had the system you are referring to, GCNet, West Blue, and all these other. I think it's material information. Now, if you add the differences in accumulation or escalation of revenue mobilization. You are talking about just within a period of is it six months, that's from July to December. We earned more than 1.6 billion Ghana cities. How does a system that does not work in five or six months generate additional 1.6 billion in revenue? Something that has not happened before in our country. So I think that this is a material fact, but uh, I can now chair, go Chair, with your leave, uh, Honorable Nominee, so from what you just said, the figures you just given up, your suggestion is that, but for COVID, the figures would have even gone higher. Exactly so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll now proceed to respond to the issue of potential judgment debt. And Again, it's a serious matter that he has raised. Um, and I need to give you the historical background. And that's the only way you can explain whether there's the potential for judgment debt or not. Now, the original agreement between the government of Ghana and GCNET was signed on the 2nd of October 2000. But this agreement did not become effective until around uh, 2003. Now, 
the agreement provided for a 10-year uh, period of service provision. So that was supposed to take us from 2003 to 2013. Now, before the expiration of the agreement in 2013, there was a first supplemental agreement, which was signed on the 26th of August 2013, giving an extension of five years to the service provider, the GCNet. So, ostensibly, this agree supplemental agreement was supposed to end in 2018. Strangely enough, in October 2016, two months before the end of the term of office of the previous government, two clear years before the expiration of this uh, agreement, first supplementary agreement, because it was supposed to end in 2018. This, there was a second supplemental agreement signed on the 28th of October 2016, extending an unexpired term of an agreement for a further two years, five years, to end in 2023. Obviously, uh, this calls for uh, some kind of inquiry. A, an agreement that has two years on expired term is now extended for a, a further five years from the time that it is supposed to end in future, to 2023. So, um, on, on assumption of... But you can keep it there. I should understand that if you have your copy of that agreement with you, which was signed in August, uh, I should recall that I facilitated the first part of it, but in the extension, I said 10 years, but after five years, subject to an assessment. You don't find that in that agreement? It was there. Yeah. I'm just saying, in what you are holding, we said that if you pursued it for those number of years. Renewal was only subject to an assessment. And I recall bringing in some experts from Belgium to have examined the whole GC net trade facilitation uh, regime. But it's intriguing the details that you have shared. But I'm saying that go more into the agreement that you signed. There was a condition that it should be subjected to an assessment for an extension. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Member. That is not in dispute. But I am submitting that after the assessment has been made and you make a decision that you would extend it, it is strange that two years on an unexpired term of an agreement you extend it for further five years. So the issue that you are advancing is not in contention about the fact that an assessment had to be made. And the assessment was made. So Mr. I Chair, think that's not me. the issue. Nomni, so was the extension that before the assessment? The extension, was it done before the assessment? I, 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 I would suppose that it was done after the uh, assessment. Chairman, I'm just putting it on the record. If you read the 2013 agreement, it was extended for 10 years. So 2013 for 10 years would have been 2023. But there was a provision in the agreement which said that because technology changes very fast, after five years into the agreement, you renew subject to an assessment. I just wanted that to be part of the record. And if you doubt it, you can refer to the agreement that you are holding, that there was dedicated provision for that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just also to put it on record, that there's no dispute about the requirement for assessment. I was just saying that if you have an unexpired term of two years on an agreement, and you give an extension of two years after the term of expiration, which is in the future, 
um, it, it's an interesting uh, case in law. That's all that I'm saying. But let's escalate the matter. So here we are. Um, we come into office in 2017. Now we realize that the supplemental agreement that was signed, both the first and the second, to all intents and purposes, ought to be construed as uh, international agreement. Because SGS, which is the majority shareholder of GCNET, is a foreign company and has majority shares in the uh, GCNET. And so there was a requirement in law for that supplemental agreement, both the first and the second, to have been submitted to Parliament. And that was not done. Secondly, Article 11.3 of the original agreement signed in 2000 that I referred to granted government the right to early termination, which is a standard clause in many... Was agreements. the 2000 agreement submitted to Parliament for approval? No, because at that time, that uh, 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 provision in law... Uh, was no, I just want to know, was no, the 2000 was, agreement was brought no to Parliament? Thank you. It was all requirement. Yes. So, um, based on these two factors, the agreement, the two supplemental agreements themselves are void in law. And so, under normal circumstances, we ought not even to have operationalized the agreement. But maybe that was history. But for us to proceed then on the basis, having found out the shortcoming, and to continue with that in itself will be further uh, uh, violating the law. And as I said also, the provisions of the original agreement gives the right of government to early termination uh, upon the payment uh, of appropriate compensation, as every agreement uh, provides. So if uh, GCNet or West Blue, as uh, the honorable member was referring to, um, de decides to go to court, um, will be able to represent it there. And uh, we'll look at the merits of, of the case. Yes, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to my boss, the Honorable Nominee. The, you gave me my first political appointment as your peer, and I will eternally be grateful for this opportunity. You have done a lot as the Minister for Trade, one district, one factory, implementation of after, after among many things. I, however, have an instruction from the Ejusso Traditional Council to bring a matter to your kind notice. And it's to do with the encroachment of free zones enclave in the Ejusso area. And I wish to demonstrate that on the... Please, the second one. The second one before this one. Good. So, sir, this is um, 1,090 acres of land that was given to free zones sometime in 2002. Unfortunately, 18 years on, not much has been done there and people have been building. So, um, all the dotted areas represent, no, go back please, uh -huh. all these areas represent different structures that people have put on there. Um, the colors represent different levels of construction, from completion to lentil to foundation. Now, when we worked, it's about one third of the total um, area. And uh, I've been asked to bring to your notice and seek your comment on the matter. Respectfully, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, um, I fully understand uh, the position that the Honorable Member finds himself being the newly elected Member of Parliament for 
uh, that particular uh, constituency which falls in that traditional area, um, that um, you will bring this concern of the people of the traditional area uh, to our notice, particularly to the notice of this uh, on our house. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the problem of encroachment um, is a major one, uh, not only for the free zones land, but as we know, uh, all over Ghana. Now, um, our view is that there are a number of options uh, to deal with encroachment. Uh, first, you can erect uh, physical uh, structures uh, around the uh, around the particular property uh, to limit the potential for encroachment. Now, we are talking about an acreage of over 1,000 uh, acres. Um, so, although that is a possibility. Uh, the expense involved um, is, is significant. And so that has been a major concern to the Ghana Free Zones Authority, uh, limiting the use of that option. The second option is to admit that the encroachment has already taken place and to then regularize uh, the actions uh, of the encroachers and then seed the, uh, the encroached uh, acreage uh, to the encroachers upon payment of uh, compensation, appropriate compensation to those who were already uh, uh, on the land. Um, we've looked at that option. Um, we have not totally discounted that, but we've also not taken a firm decision on that matter, uh, because this is public land, and for whatever reason, uh, it, it is strange that for the project that was to be executed for that traditional area, that you have residents uh, uh, within that area who would then uh, do uh, such, such, such a thing as encroaching on those lands. But as I said, uh, it's already happened and we are investigating that. When the Free Zones Authority uh, realized the extent of the encroachment, uh, we, they engaged the services of a, a surveyor to assess the extent of the enclosed area. So, so that uh, uh, an appropriate decision uh, will be uh, taken. Now, I, I'm just uh, basically to uh, end on this note that uh, we feel that the way forward is to accelerate the development uh, that is intended on the proposed uh, site and that automatically uh, then also serves as another option of warding away uh, and coaches. And we are continuously engaging with the chiefs and people of uh, Jesu uh, to synthesize them on the need for the traditional uh, uh, rulers and then the people of uh, Jesu themselves to protect uh, the, that property. Uh, so basically, uh, it's not been left in abeyance it's a matter that is uh, uh, being seriously addressed. So, uh, Honorable Member, I think you can convey this uh, to the uh, traditional rulers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Minister, I want to follow up on this one. Uh, I've been actively involved in it from the beginning, when I was at DVLA, became a member of Parliament, Committee on Roads and Transport, we visited it. Let's be clear, does the Ministry of Trade wish to do anything on that site? It's been 19 years. There's a conflict of the personal needs versus the public need. Does the Ministry of Trade or Free Zones Board wish to do anything on the land? 
And when are they going to do it? Uh, Honorable Chair, I agree um, with you with uh, the sentiments um, that um, you have on this matter. But I think you would appreciate uh, that this matter uh, is similar to other cases around the country where uh, pieces of land have been acquired by uh, government in some cases uh, through compulsory acquisition. But they have not been developed for that purpose. Multiple cases. The problem has always been a question of resources. Because all over the world we know that industrial enclaves or industrial zones or industrial parks are a major instrument for industrialization. So it is perfectly in order and it is appropriate for government to acquire or develop land banks. We talk about this all the time to develop land banks that can now then become available to potential investors. But the point is that once you acquire the uh, piece of land, you pay compensation, and it's a lot of money. And now you have uh, uh, to develop uh, the land. And so it has purely been a question of uh, resources. But that has informed the new policy that I have adopted um, uh, on assumption of office uh, in, in the first term uh, of the MPP government, that it is not sustainable for government to continue through the free zones to be acquiring land banks when they do not have the capacity to mobilize resources to develop these lands, as um, uh, the current matter before us uh, speaks to. And so our, uh, our position now is that let's provide incentives for private sector developers to engage in uh, you know, the exercise of developing these uh, land banks. And then government supports them to ensure that, uh, that they survive. So this is currently uh, the policy, but this is an old acquisition. Chairman, if the nominee back to this if you have the constitution with you if you have your constitution with you article 25 and 6 let it guide you with what chairman said you acquired it for a certain purpose is it being used for that purpose if it is not being used let it revert back to the original owners that's what the constitution provides for and what you've lost out already counted as lost put what is remaining into use and my view is that industrial park you can start developing it uh, thank you mr chair uh, I, I, for want of time i didn't want to veer into other areas uh, that uh, that that we are uh, working on but again when i talk about industrial transformation agenda it's not just one D1F, and it's unfortunate people just only refer to one D1F. But another key pillar of this transformation agenda is to develop industrial parks around the, uh, uh, the country. We call it the one region, one park. And as I said, this is in collaboration with the private sector. So as I speak now, this land in question that the minority leader is referring to has now been uh, incorporated into a new project, which is called the Greater Kumasi Industrial City and Economic Zone, which is a 4,500-acre initiative to be developed by uh, the land uh, under uh, and this is going to be the now major industrial uh, enclave after. Because let's uh, understand that the Ashanti region, and for that matter, uh, that centre uh, where is being developed this as an industrial, connects six or seven regions in Ghana. 
Greater Accra, uh, Ashanti region, Western North, part of Central region, part of Eastern region, is also the transit corridor to the Sahelian countries. So we cannot uh, be concentrating our industrial agenda only in Accra and Tema. So this major initiative will now incorporate this site uh, under question. So um, it's very much along the lines that the minority leader is referring to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, the, let me convey the assurances of the Adjusto Traditional Council that we are firmly behind you on this project and we want to see the project going on. But the opportunity calls for the delayed takeoff of these projects. And I'm happy that um, uh, you have referred to the 4,500 acres in the Greater Kumasi area for the industrial city, which also happens to be in the Ejusu constituency. The delay takeoff has resulted in the denial of legal rights of the local people to even farm on these lands. How soon are we likely to see companies setting up at the free zones um, enclave to provide jobs and industrial opportunities for the communities. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, I do not want to uh, give a specific answer in terms of time, but I'm sure the Honorable Member of Parliament has just taken office. If he consults with the uh, traditional leaders, um, and then also, uh, we would be glad and pleased to uh, work with him uh, so that uh, we can get some certainty in terms of timelines. Because as I've explained, this is not about government. This is about government facilitating uh, uh, and providing incentives to the private sector uh, to undertake this project. So as I speak now, engineering designs have been conducted, um, all the uh, site plans and the uh, environmental uh, uh, assessment is being done. So a lot of work is being done. This is going to be one of the uh, b biggest projects uh, to be implemented in terms of industrial activity in our country. So obviously it takes time. And we are also working uh, uh, on uh, the mobilization of resources. Uh, to pay for compensation. So it's work in progress. Finally. And, and it's, been, Finally. it's been part of the budget statement, uh, I think, last year. Thank you. Finally, um, the industrial, and I want to assure my boss that I'm ever ready to partner with him to carry out this program. Industrial city projects and economic zones come with provision of certain amenities like water, extension of electricity, and good roads, especially within the enclave. So far, all the allocations that we have there, the 1,090, there's a second diagram which talks about the greater Kumasi area. This is almost about the 4,500 acres you spoke about. And then also the 400 acres for Buankra in Landport. Um, they do not have the social amenities I refer to, like water, uh, good roads, and electricity, which, of course, will serve as incentive for potential investors into those areas. Um, how, please, can we have your assurance that we are going to have an extension of the supply of these amenities onto um, these allocations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, you have the assurance, Honorable Member, and I think this is basic project development. Um, you, you cannot talk about such a big project uh, without providing off-site infrastructure. So the engineering studies that I'm talking about has actually been in respect the off-site infrastructure. The off-site infrastructure includes extending water, electricity, uh, telecommunication services. All those things are part of the off-site infrastructure. And um, the last mile infrastructure will then be undertaken by 
the anchor tenants who come into the industrial city. And so I think um, it goes without saying that a big project like this um, has to have uh, all the amenities for it to succeed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. Honorable nominee, um, first let me ask you, um, what is your position on green industry and the advantages involved in this, and what is Ghana's policy on the green industry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to be sure that I had the Honorable Member right. Um, is it green industry? Yes, thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, as we know, uh, globally, the world is going green. And um, we are following that developmental trajectory and that development uh, path. Um, and we are working in collaboration with other sector ministries um, to ensure that uh, we also go green in terms of our industrialization uh, plan and uh, effort. But to a large extent, because we are driving a policy and program that is supporting the private sector, you know, to intervene uh, in these areas and not government itself um, making the investments. Um, it also, to a large extent, depends on what we are discussing with our, uh, our, our private sector collaborators. But as part of the environmental assessment uh, that is done, um, that is a major part of uh, what uh, the uh, industrial transformation plan calls for. And it's, uh, um, it's in all areas, including green energy uh, and, and other aspects of the uh, uh, green, uh, I would say, green revolution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Chairman, there's a huge money out there in that industry, so I will plead that we, Honorable Nominee and I sat in a meeting at the AU on this particular issue, and I, I'm surprised up to now we have not really taken steps to see how we can get something out of this. But my second, which is also on a decision that has been taken, there has been advocacy for the setting up of a common West African shipping line to facilitate trade on the base of aviation as we ASCA and financial as we Ecobank and the rest. What is your take on this and how far have the West African countries and the trade ministers taken this particular decision and what is Ghana's take on it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm happy you've raised, uh, the Honorable Member has raised this particular point. Because part of the challenge that we've had with ECOWAS trade is moving crews across our borders, uh, both in terms of ease of movement and then also freight costs. And we all know that um, shipping, uh, it's probably the best uh, way forward if you want to move uh, goods in significant uh, volumes. And so uh, the, the challenge of developing uh, shipping uh, interconnectivity between our West African uh, countries has always been on the drawing board. And um, as trade ministers, uh, we've been working uh, kindly with a private sector group uh, in which the chambers of commerce are very actively involved uh, to be able to develop this uh, shipping, uh, ECOWAS uh, shipping uh, network. Uh, my understanding is that the major challenge has been a question of resources, but it's, uh, it's on the drawing board. And now that uh, we are talking about going beyond ECOWAS uh, to the rest of Africa, it becomes even more critical 
Because according to the protocols underpinning after, you can use raw materials from uh, your sub-region because the regional economic communities are still existing uh, within the belly of the AFTA. So uh, it is important and appropriate for us to now ensure that this regional uh, shipping network uh, becomes a reality. Uh, it is not going to be just uh, the governments uh, of West Africa, but then I think more importantly, the private sector with the support from the de development finance institutions like African Development Bank um, uh, and then the ECOWAS uh, Bank for uh, Development. But I can assure you that it's a matter that is under, still under very serious consideration. I'm sure when you were at the ministry, uh, you, were, uh, you were also uh, apprised of this, yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, now to something that touches my heart, because um, you know I'm a member of parliament for the audio deal. Retail trade and the constant friction between Guta and foreigners in our retail trade sector. And one of the most serious ones we've seen recently is a tendency for foreigners to take advantage of our GIPC law, you know, get married to Ghanaians in order to <laughs> own shops within the retail market space to avoid the, let, let me say, the uh, scrutiny of Guta and other Ghanaian institutions that monitor these things. What are we going to do to ensure that we respect the protocols that demand that when it comes to retail trade is a preserve of nationals and indigents? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> the issue of foreigners in the retail, domestic retail trade uh, it's obviously a very vexed one, and um, it's been going on for, for decades. What the ministry has done is to take a firm position on the matter that, according to the uh, laws of our country, there are certain enterprises or activities that are currently reserved for Ghanaians. And it's clearly specified under the GIPC Act. Now, the lack of enforcement of the provisions of the GIPC Act is what has led to this tension that continues to exist between uh, foreign traders and then, um, let's say, Guta and other uh, uh, traders in Ghana. Now, beyond the provisions of the GIPC Act, there are also several provisions in different enactments that have to be respected, whether you're a Ghanaian or a foreigner, and you want to engage in retail trade. The challenge that we've had is that even if the provision in the GIPC Act was waived, and say even if it was waived for a variety of reasons, there's still a requirement for foreigners engaged in retail trade to abide by the laws of Ghana. And so what uh, has occurred is the uh, abuse of these uh, uh, laws and regulations, I mean, whether it's immigration laws, whether laws relating to revenue, uh, you know, GRE regulations, or even regulations in respect of uh, business operating licenses that is under the authority of our uh, metropolitan and district assemblies. You know, we cannot have a situation in a country 
where Ghanaians are compelled by these regulatory authorities to abide by these laws. And then we turn, um, uh, we turn around, you know, to ignore when these uh, same rules are being violated by uh, foreigners. And I think it is important for us also to uh, make note of the fact that it is not about targeting specific nationals, particularly in West Africa. We are talking about foreigners in retail trade. And so, because of the tension that has arisen over the years, um, we have had very serious consultations uh, between uh, our various countries and then even at the level of ECOWAS. And um, we've agreed that foreigners who want to engage in retail trade in Ghana must go by the laws of our country. I know that issues have been raised in respect of conflict between provisions in the ECOWAS protocol and then our domestic law. But the law is clear on this. And as I indicated, even if that requirement of the GIPC was waived, the other regulations have to be respected. What I can say in conclusion, though, is that in order to ensure that we maintain uh, our long-standing bonds of friendship um, and economic engagement, particularly with our neighbors in West Africa, that we've taken a position that in all cases where there are violations of these provisions, that we must make sure that we engage and consult with each other rather than take arbitrary actions. So that has been the position. Chairman, uh, I've finished, but let me yeah, also yeah. inform the honorable nominee that uh, in looking at that angle, I think he must engage more because now the Chinese have virtually taken over after, the market. After we Accra. approve them, we can have a private chat with him. Uh, yes, Lina, I thought you... John, thank you. Uh, honorable Minister, let me commend you. Join earlier speakers. Uh, relative question asked by the Honorable Neil and Chief Van der Poel, and I recognize that you're taking the trouble to run us through the existence of the law and, and all that. In recent times, we've experienced a situation where there was near, or there were even exchanges, clashes between our nationals and other foreign nationals. Then, all of a sudden, it's been quiet. I think we've had, it's been on and off. Uh, but I believe this didn't just happen. Are you able to apprise this committee some concrete measures, however temporary they are, that this government led by your good self has been able to undertake to restore the seeming quietness uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we, uh, as I indicated, um, have in particular uh, made uh, an effort uh, to consult with uh, our friends, particularly in Nigeria, uh, in Togo, and uh, Benin, about finding ways of addressing uh, these issues that uh, are under reference. Um, we also had a delegation uh, from the Parliament of Nigeria that visited uh, and we had uh, consultations and engagement with them. So the point that I, I would like to uh, stress is that the consultations and the engagement that have been led by the Ministry under the leadership of our President is what has made it possible for us not to sweep the matter under the carpet, but to bring the tension down. And that is how come you see that um, the tension is not uh, as intense as um, they were. Yeah. Thank you, Honorable Minister. 
The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and the implications opening up our market. Have we taken advantage of the institutions, policies, and systems to build local industries that can produce competitively? to be able to take advantage of this continental free trade arrangement that we are putting in place, particularly um, Exim Bank that we established, Ghana Exim Bank. How have we, over the four years during which you were Minister for Trade and Industry, use the resources there to support efficient local industries to be able to produce for um, export. Do you monitor industries to be able to assess those that are doing well that the state should provide support to become big producers for export? so that they can compete with the imports that are creating problems for us in our markets. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Honourable Member, um, I had earlier on made reference uh, to a variety of industrial activities and interventions that the government has been engaged in, uh, all designed to promote and support our local businesses. First, to be able to import substitute or produce for the local market, but more importantly, also to be able to export. Um, so I've gone through this uh, earlier on extensively, whether it's under the One District, One Factory program, or whether it is support at the district level through our business uh, resource centers. But beyond this general uh, program of industrialization. With the coming into force of AFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, we've established a national office that is currently implementing a national program of action, specifically targeting uh, companies that can produce competitively uh, for the export market, particularly in Africa, but also uh, uh, for Europe and the United States, because we have uh, duty-free and quota-free access uh, to these markets also. Um, now, these uh, uh, program interventions are supposed to cover a variety of areas. One is enhancing productive capacity. Uh, second is ensuring uh, that there is access to affordable credit that is working uh, with the financial institutions and banks. The other is also identifying specific market information about market opportunities in different uh, countries. Uh, the other relates to ensuring that we provide technical assistance for quality and standards. Um, we are also supporting them in terms of uh, human resource, uh, capacity building. Uh, you know, going into exports is, is, is difficult. And we uh, are uh, doing uh, that also to enhance their capacity to export. I made reference earlier on, I'm not sure if you were here, that uh, we have a program that is targeting companies that are already exporting uh, to Africa. So these are low hanging fruits. So we do a needs assessment of these companies uh, so that we can have a targeted program that helps them to enhance their current levels of production. But there are others that are not exporting to Africa, but exporting uh, to other parts of the world. 
So we are guiding them also now to be able to also identify uh, opportunities for the African market. So a lot is going on and uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult to have the opportunity to talk about everything. Namini doesn't know Honorable Muntaka is here. When you give an elaborate answer, he takes a note and to come on cross-examination. So he says today is Friday, he doesn't want to do his usual thing. So if you give very short answers, we'll have few questions for you. Yeah. He says if you give an elaborate answer, you will take notes. Honorable, I thought you were going to ask a question. Yes, Honorable. Yeah. Um, Honorable nominee and former minister for trade and industry. Now, the, the issue with exports and imports and local production to substitute imports really is underlined by price. Price. At what price are importers uh, the, the goods that are being imported, at what price is it being produced in the country of export? Okay? And then at what price is the same good being produced here? Then you add tax and etc. to get whether or not the products will be competitive here. Now, do you have a mechanism for taking items and analyzing critically the inputs? and trying to deal with the inefficiencies in the price builder for the production of those items. Let's take, for instance, rice. We're importing, you know, close to a million or more tons of, metric tons of rice every year. And then we're talking about producing rice locally. But if you compare the unit cost of production in Thailand, and you compare the unit cost of production in Ghana, Unless you deal with the inefficiencies in the price build-up in terms of the unit cost of production, you can never be competitive. So somebody will still produce in Thailand, ship it, come here, still handle logistical costs, and still be able to outcompete the local producer of rice here because he has a price build-up that is just inefficient by imposed fertilizer pricing, by imposed you know, chemical pricing, by all sorts of impositions. That just produces an inefficient production cost. As a ministry, you have a strategy for a more detailed work on production cost. Because we, we, I've been at the ministry before as a deputy minister. All the things that you are saying today, we said it at that time, and etc. But the key thing is to zero in on specific items you are producing and the efficiency of what you are doing, and the ultimately the price of the item. How are you able to deal with that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we have a very comprehensive program of support to our enterprises that we support. And uh, the services are not provided by staff of the ministry. We engage uh, technical experts uh, in many cases that would uh, interrogate the areas that we've identified, um, that would examine areas that um, lead to cost build-up and operational inefficiency. So our team of experts and consultants are doing exactly what, what you're saying. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Minister, congratulations. Uh, let's move into the area of the automotive industry. Uh, can I proceed, please? Yeah. Very well. Um, late last year, you introduced to this uh, economy an automotive industry policy. And um, subsequent to that, uh, there were some ensuing controversies between government and car, vehicle importers, garage owners, and um, 
I have a lot of them in my constituency, the Europeans of the world. We've seen that a lot of huge companies in the automotive industry have decided to set up here as a result of the policy you ushered into being, Peugeot, Nissan, VW, etc. What is the status of this laudable program in the face of these uh, challenges from uh, our local industry players in that sector? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, the implementation of the automobile uh, development policy um, has undoubtedly yielded very positive results, and I think um, I, I do not need to speak to that. But it is clear that there has been some misunderstanding between uh, different stakeholders about the impact and the effect of this policy on their businesses. Uh, first is in respect of uh, what has been described in the policy and the customs amendment law as uh, salvage uh, vehicles. Um, reference has also been made uh, to the issue of overage, importation of overage uh, vehicles. Um, and uh, regrettably, there was um, a lot of controversy that had been generated uh, over this. But I'd like to assure this House that there is really no need for that tension to arise uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, because if you look at the provisions of the Customs Amendment Act, which refers to salvage vehicles, Unfortunately, the law did not uh, specify what is described as uh, physical damage or wreckage. Um, I don't need to get into uh, the details of the law. But we explained to the stakeholders that there will be the need for regulations uh, to be put in place that will further define the implementation arrangements of what is in the law. And uh, I think that uh, to a large extent, the industry players have now come to appreciate and understand that there's really no threat uh, to the businesses that uh, they are undertaking. And that, in actual fact, they stand to benefit from the development of the, uh, of, of the auto industry in Ghana in, in a variety of ways. So whether it's the issue of salvage vehicles or the issue of uh, over age cars, we've come to a common understanding with the industry players that in some cases um, there's a specific requirement that it is only when the Minister of Trade um, on, uh, advises the Minister of Finance that certain provisions of the law would kick in. And so it still lies in the bosom of the Ministry. And we, we continuously engage with the industry players to ensure that the implementation of the provisions of this law does not uh, negatively, negatively affect their business. I'm happy um, the Georgia and Co., the garage owners in my constituency will be happy. Mr. Minister, last year you also uh, saw into being the Enterprise Ghana Agency Act 2020. And the economy is largely informal and um, it's made up of a lot of uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. And BSSI, the Maslow's of the world. How does it, this link with your 10 point industrial um, transformation plan for this country with the, with the DRCs and, and under the Rural Enterprise Program? Thank you. That's my last question, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, one of the 10 pillars. Uh, of our industrial transformation agenda 
is the development of micro, small, and medium uh, enterprises. And so, um, under this component, uh, we've introduced a number of interventions. One is the transformation of MBSSI to strengthen their organizational and management capacity, uh, and also to resource them to be able now to to ensure that they are able to uh, efficiently perform their role as an apex body for MSMEs. So part of it was developing the MSME policy to support the transformation of NDSSI. Uh, secondly, as you alluded to, uh, now we've expanded the scope of NDSSI and their reach into the districts with the establishment of the business resource centers, which uh, are under the supervision and oversight of MBSSI. And so to a large extent, um, the MBSSI is going to become a reformed organization so that they can uh, deepen their support to MSMEs. As you rightly indicated, over 90% of our enterprises uh, belong to that category. And we needed a transformed organization to be able to support uh, these enterprises. Most grateful, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me congratulate the nominee and uh, indicate that though I do not know how long he will stay at the ministry before he resigns to run for president, I certainly wish him well. Uh, the first question is uh, to seek the nominee's uh, reflections on the exciting times in, the, in international trade following the emergence of the first African and first female Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Obonja Iwiela. Uh, many trade followers in Ghana had uh, thought that if there would be a first African Director General, it would be the Venerable John Alan Kwejo Chairman Tim. But uh, uh, Nigerians are good cousins, and so it is well in order, and we are all excited about this development. And we congratulate Dr. Ogonjo Iwiela. But the question is, this is happening at a time that we are at the forefront of establishing the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. How do you think that Africa, and for that matter Ghana, which is hosting the AFTA Secretariat, can leverage this exciting development at the WTO? Uh, the new Director General has said that she would pursue deep reforms, she would uh, address uh, matters to do with protectionism, uh, subsidies, and all the bilateral trade wars that are going on that leaves uh, underdeveloped countries as uh, the victims of all of this uh, power play in rich economies. How do you think that Ghana can leverage uh, this development? The first African Director General uh, with our AFTA agenda uh, to expand the frontiers of fair trade for the benefit of uh, our economies and, and to yield to job creation as we seek a rebound uh, from the effect of uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, as um, the Honorable Member has very aptly uh, described the WTO, the main objective of the WTO is to expand the frontiers of free trade. And to a large extent, that's the same objective of the African continental free trade area, to expand the frontiers of free trade in Africa by um, liberalizing tariffs, and then also ensuring the free flow of goods and services uh, between uh, 
uh, African countries. So to a large extent, um, we are working towards the same objective. And in that regard, having an African as the Director General of the WTO provides an opportunity for us in Africa whilst we embark on this major uh, initiative of liberalizing trade between ourselves. How we use our collaboration between ourselves as a launching pad uh, to enhance our participation in the global market, which is superintended uh, by the WTO. So basically, if we can deepen our trade under after amongst ourselves, that will then become uh, a launching pad for us to increase uh, our presence in global trade. And I think that once you have a fellow African, I mean, it, it can only be to advantage. So we hope we can fully uh, use that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's my way of quick follow-up. Has uh... one of members today? We will want to close early, so do your second one, please. I announced at the beginning, and we'll be smart today. So please, your second question. My second question, Mr. Chairman, will relate to a rather. tragic development that occurred when the Honorable Nominee was Minister, tragic for local business and local initiative, local industries. On the 16th of February, a Sunday, 16th of February 2020, at midnight, the Ghana Trade Fair Company Limited, which is one of the institutions you supervise, uh, it's under your ministry, carried out a demolition of some 28 companies at the trade fair. The managers of these companies indicate that they were taken by surprise, they were not notified. National security operatives are said to have carried out the demolition. I have the pictures of the demolition here. You see machinery, valuable equipment, and uh, office accessories all dis destroyed in the demolition. Can you tell us the circumstances of this demolition? Did you authorize it as sector minister? And don't you think that that is a blight on your reputation as champion of Ghanaian industries? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. I, uh, I think uh, it, it's unfortunate uh, that um, uh, we have people who used to be tenants uh, on the property of the Ghana Trade Authority uh, who have been affected by this redevelopment uh, exercise. But as you are aware, the Trade Fair Authority um, is a private company, although government uh, has had a uh, full share, share holding in the company. And it has a board. Uh, the board uh, took a decision that for the redevelopment exercise uh, to go on smoothly, it required uh, the evacuation of uh, tenants from the site. And the relevant notices, um, as far as I'm reliably informed, had been given to the tenants over a three-year period. And like with any major development project, uh, you have a critical path uh, that you follow in terms of uh, project execution. And so the continued stay of the tenants was inhibiting uh, progress uh, in the development of the site. 
and um, basically the board took a decision that uh, once notices have been given over an extended period of time, uh, that they'll go ahead with the demolition exercise. We intervened uh, at a point uh, to see whether there was some arrangement that could be made to extend uh, uh, the, the time uh, for them to be able to find alternative locations. And in actual fact, uh, I am aware that uh, the, uh, the tenants were given uh, some extension in terms of time. But as I said, uh, with project development, it comes to a point where the execution uh, requires you to take certain uh, actions. So uh, that's what I, I can say about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, I move to my third question, just to indicate that uh, this sudden announcement of no follow-ups is constraining. Uh, the Honorable John Kuma had follow-ups. I don't know why I cannot have follow-ups. Uh, I will take up this matter when we go, when we go into conflict. Uh, you know, I have been very liberal. I don't, but I don't think on this instance we you are being fair to me. Do early. Can you do your third one? Uh, I will place on record that you have not been fair to me uh, because these are important Keep issues. Keep that record to yourself. Point. What did, what did, what did My third question, honorable nominee, will be from the 7th November 2018 official report of parliament. The last time this house discussed the 1D1F flagship initiative. At column 787 and 788, when you brief this house on the status of the 1D1F program, you provided the regional breakdown of 1D1F interventions across the various regions. Parliament did raise concern about the unfair distribution if uh, I would have to make reference to the table you provided, the Upper East region did not have a single 1D1F uh, project, zero. Upper West had only one. Western region had only one. Volta region had only one. We did request that you consider a fair distribution of this 1D1F intervention. My question is, did you respectfully carry out this observation and concern that Parliament expressed? And can you give us the current breakdown of the 1D1F initiatives across the 16 regions of Ghana? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, in an earlier question posed by the uh, minority leader, I had indicated that, unfortunately, I do not have the regional breakdown. But I can assure you that the position uh, is better now than the time that I made this representation to this house. Thank you. Yes. Very well. There you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Honorable Nominee. My question has to do with the automobile industry. And uh, you get the sense that Ghana is positioning itself as the automobile assembly hub for West Africa. Would you be able to tell us the level of local content in terms of involving Ghanaians in this industry to enable transferability of skills, which might eventually lead to Ghanaian ownership of some of these uh, companies. Is there a plan towards ensuring that Ghanaians benefit from this industry? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. 
Uh, Honourable Member, there are different ways that uh, Ghanaians uh, will be benefiting uh, from this uh, industry. The first and obvious one uh, is through employment and skills development, uh, because the majority of the people that will be employed uh, will be Ghanaians, not just at the lower level, but also at the supervisory and managerial levels. Uh, secondly, there is a significant opportunity for Ghanaians to also become dealers. Uh, although initially uh, the trend is for existing uh, dealers who may not necessarily be Ghanaians, who are now the local partners of the, let's say, big automobile companies. We, as part of our policy, um, have insisted that we need to decentralize the dealership uh, of these locally produced vehicles, particularly as you move out of Accra, uh, Kumasi, and the big center. So I think there's general agreement, and the current dealers who are working with the big companies themselves are very pleased about this, because they cannot overextend themselves to every part of the uh, of the uh, of the country. So, if my very good friend uh, Honourable Ayariga wants to take up the dealership for Volkswagen in the whole of the uh, northern regions, obviously that becomes uh, an opportunity, an economic opportunity. So that's another area that they will benefit. The third, another area that they will benefit is also in terms of. Uh, component manufacture, uh, because in the long run, when you assemble cars, you do not optimize your benefits on, until you start producing the component uh, parts. And so we know that we have the capacity in this country with uh, the support of new technology, let's say to develop Swami into a major component uh, manufacturing Hub. And we've had discussions with the global companies that are already um, showing up in this country. And they are very excited because the closer you are to your components for the assembly, the cheaper and uh, more efficient it is for you. So they are very interested in supporting uh, local content, not just in terms of employment, but in terms of... Thank you. And my second question is back to one district, one factory. You just described it as a revolution, and uh, we think yeah, the initiative was looking at restructuring the Ghanaian economy to make it more local-based. With hindsight, will you say that in an effort to cover the entire districts in this country within four years was a little bit overly ambitious? and whether you didn't consider staggering the, the projects so that you scaled them up as we went along, or maybe that consideration, political considerations overwhelmed some of these uh, other considerations. What, what, what would hindsight, what would you, what your thoughts be on the manner in which the one district, one factory was implemented? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable Member, um, I can understand why, from a conceptual point of view, this might have sounded a bit ambitious that you would want to have a factory in every district. But I think the philosophy underpinning this was not for government to be establishing these enterprises. This is designed to facilitate uh, support to the private sector uh, to establish these factories. So far, I think there's been overwhelming uh, interest and support uh, for this. So uh, in a sense, uh, the, I, I do not think that uh, on hindsight, that we were being uh, impractical or, or over ambitious.
However, I would also agree with you that there are certain parts of the country where we may not necessarily be able to attract private investors uh, in establishing 1D1F companies. So in those districts, uh, government has made it a policy that government will intervene directly and incubate some of these enterprises and then later on offload that to the private sector if it becomes uh, necessary. But I think the principle is that every district in Ghana deserves uh, to have development. And uh, all these districts have natural resources that can be developed. Uh, we need employment around the country. So uh, it may be an ambitious target, but if you see what we've done so far, I think uh, it is realizable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very well. Gisela. She's oh, oh. ready. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Honorable nominee, I'd like to ask you about the ECOWAS single currency program, which has been with us for a very long time. I mean, this is a program intended to remove trade barriers, reduce transaction costs, and to boost economic activities within the sub-region. But year in, year out, what we hear is that X number of countries have met the convergence criteria. And then at another time, you'd hear that the figure has changed. As Minister for Trade, you've been there for four years. What, what, what are the reasons militating against the adoption of an ECOWAS single currency? And if given the nod, what critical role do you think Ghana can play to ensure that the ECOWAS single currency project comes to fruition? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think in principle, we all agree that a common currency in ECOWAS will enhance trade between our countries. And that's why uh, all the governments have pursued vigorously uh, this initiative. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the convenience criteria, it is not altogether surprising that uh, we've not been able to move forward uh, to achieve uh, our objective because it's very difficult to be able to get all countries achieve the convergence criteria at the same time. I think that going forward, uh, if we look at what is being uh, done under the AFCFT, uh, whilst we still hope that we would eventually have the benefits of a common currency, whether it is for uh, ECOWAS or for Africa under AFTA. There's a new initiative uh, which is pioneered by the Afri Af Afri Exim Bank, which is called the Payment Settlement Mechanism. And that allows uh, every state party or traders in a state party to be able to uh, use their local currency uh, to trade, that's to, let's say, if they're importing, to import goods from another African country without the benefit of a common currency, which was really the objective of standardizing the medium of exchange. Um, so this payment settlement mechanism, when it is fully activated, at least temporarily, uh, would still facilitate trade as was intended by the common currency, uh, whilst we hopefully work towards achieving that goal uh, one day. As you know, even in Europe, uh, it took quite a bit of time for the euro to become a reality. Uh, but it's a target I think we'll still uh, work towards it. Thank you. Honorable nominee, 
Uh, this afternoon, you've spoken extensively about the African continental free trade area, and we want the bid to host the Secretariat here in Accra. We are all very excited about the prospects of um, the African continental free trade area, but I have reservations. Why? Because we've lived with ECOWAS since the early 70s. And ECOWAS was supposed to guarantee for us a common market, a free trade area within the West African sub-region. But these objectives have never materialized. And so, um, sometime last year, Nigeria, without any provocation, shut down their border at Seme. We, as a, the shutdown of the border clearly affected uh, Ghanaian businesses. I, I remember a delegation was sent there to inspect the damage that was caused. On the other hand, we are also being accused of not treating foreigners engaged in the retail trade uh, in our country by, by member, member states within the ECOWAS sub-region. What is so unique about the African continental free trade area? And, and, and what do you think would make the African continental free trade area succeed, unlike its counterpart, ECOWAS? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, there are two fundamental um, components of the African continental free trade area, which hopefully will make it easier uh, for us to trade amongst ourselves than has occurred uh, within ECOWAS or the other regional economic communities. First is the fact that one of the protocols under AFTA, which uh, we have negotiated is the protocol on dispute settlement. And um, honorable member, being a lawyer yourself, um, uh, you would appreciate that when there are provisions uh, of law that uh, reg uh, regulate the trade between, uh, let's say, uh, state parties. Uh, it becomes more difficult for people to flout uh, or to, let's say, create artificial barriers, as has happened, let's say, in ECOWAS. Because now, any, any trader in any state party that feels aggrieved by the action of another state party can bring, uh, can file a complaint under the dispute settlement mechanism. And the cost associated uh, with, uh, you know, this dispute settlement is a very significant one. I'm taking a cue from what uh, happens in the WTO. So I think it's a major component that distinguishes it from uh, what we now have uh, in ECOWAS and other regs. The second one is an operational, a digital operational instrument that has been developed to, again, deal with some of the challenges that uh, you alluded to. So this digital platform allows a trader, let's say that is moving goods from Ghana to uh, Nigeria, again to file a complaint on the digital platform, giving specific details of the, uh, that uh, complaint. And then there are provisions that require the trader in the state party to address uh, that uh, challenge or bottleneck within a certain specified time. So I think that uh, that would also help. I cannot guarantee that we will eliminate all the uh, barriers, but um, the, 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 the protocols and the annexes that have been negotiated in this CFTA is very comprehensive, and I think that will probably make the difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Honorable nominee, this is my last question. Um, you've also spoken about the vehicle assembly automotive um, policy, which was 
launched sometime in 2019. And the policy has so far yielded some results. So Volkswagen, Nissan, Toyota are coming into our country. But don't you think that this policy is, is, is going to suffocate local companies such as um, Kantanka, the Kantanka Group, which is an indigenous company involved in vehicle manufacture and assemblage? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable Chair, on the contrary, um, this particular policy is very supportive of local companies that will uh, also seek to participate uh, in the automotive uh, industry. And just to be very specific, because you mentioned Kantanka, um, you know, there are different grades of licenses that are given to these automobile companies. As I speak now, Kantanka has the highest level of certification. Um, they have what we call an enhanced um, SKD certificate so that they can do more than the other global uh, players. Uh, and to, to testify to the importance of some of these uh, uh, provisions uh, in the policy. Kantanka has doubled its production capacity uh, since they were given a license uh, to uh, operate under the framework of the policy. So it is the other way around. And um, the appeal that we are making is that uh, as many Ghanaians as possible ought to take advantage of this new development, because I can assure you that in the next couple of years, Ghana is going to become the new automotive manufacturing hub in Africa, because this is the first time um, that around the world you have a country that is now entering into this industry and has been able to attract all the major global players at the same time. You know, almost invariably, uh, they will start with one company that comes in to test, you know, whether it is really something worth it. But to have Volkswagen, uh, Toyota, Suzuki, Nissan, Isuzu, and uh, very soon we are going to give also a pre bona fide license um, to Hyundai and to Chang'an, you know, and Peugeot also uh, will be participating later on in the year. I think this in itself the matter speaks for itself, as we say in law. Hello, members. We've done two hours. Let's stretch for some 10 minutes, then we'll come back, continue. Please. Honorable, you can also stretch for 10 minutes. That's our instructions, protocol.
administration of NLGRD, director of Ghana Health Service, um, director of the National Association of the Deaf, um, His Excellency, the German Ambassador, distinguished representatives of the media. I also have to apologize uh, that we had to let you wait and start the event now. Um, COVID-19 is spreading fast around the world. Currently in Ghana, we are experiencing the second wave. However, research on the transmission of the virus clearly indicates how to minimize the risk of contracting COVID-19. Unfortunately, a lot of people are still ignoring to adhere to these measures, in particular to wear masks properly in public spaces. We would like to support the government of Ghana to sensitize citizens on the risks involved and how to protect themselves, their families, friends, and communities. Risk communication is having a significant impact on the behavior of people. Wearing masks, keeping the right distance, following hygiene measures will avoid further transmission of COVID-19. Misinformation, on the other hand, can lead to disregarding regarding protective measures and subsequently taking the risk to get infected. With our risk communication campaign, we would like to contribute to the dissemination of the right information across the country. At the same time, we experience the fear of the people to get infected, which leads to stigmatization of those ones who are currently or were sick with COVID-19. This again can lead to people trying to hide their infection because they do not want to be exposed. But they should quarantine and inform those ones um, they have been in contact uh, with to avoid further transmission. If this is not done consequently, the spread cannot be st stopped. That's why it was important for us to address stigmatization in our campaign as well. As the name of our program says, governance development, we pay specific attention to the aspect of inclusion. Therefore, we wanted to direct our support to those ones who have challenges in accessing information. Blind people are often exploring their environment by touching items. Hygiene measures are of particular importance to them. Further, the concept of social distancing will be difficult to follow for visually impaired. We develop descriptive jingles for them on Bluetooth devices which are shared among blind people. Trainings are currently provided to visually and hearing impaired and their caregivers. Apart from risk communication, the Governance for Inclusive Development Program is also involved in other support measures. The provision of personal protective equipment to revenue collectors of 100 MMDAs across the country. Let me emphasize that the entire equipment was locally produced and includes face masks, soaps, sanitizers, and hand washing stations. The revenue collectors will also play a part in the sensitization of the citizens and distribute these leaflets. I think you all got a version of this. Last year, in August, we set up an eight-bed intensive care unit, including ventilators in Takoradi at the Afia Gnanfa Hospital. Further measures are planned, such as provision of boreholes and regional coordinating councils to improve access to water. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the program manager of the Governance for Inclusive Development program. It still feels strange to me to be so active in the health sector. Usually we provide support to the government of Ghana in mobilization of domestic revenues, accountability, and public financial management. However, when the situation changes, it is our task to adapt. Distinguished guests and representatives of the media, we have come a long way from the first idea to contribute to improved risk communication until the launch event today. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Ghana Health Service and in particular the Health Promotion Division, Dr. Da Costa, and his team for their valuable inputs, their engagement in testing the materials across the country and now also the involvement in the trainings. I would like to thank the Ghana Blind Union and the Ghana National Association of the Deaf for their great cooperation.
and I would like to thank our consultant, Ms. Cecilia Seno from Hope for Future Generation and her team for their ideas, inputs, and the organization of the whole process. I would also like to thank my team for making the whole campaign and today's event possible. They have worked day and night, weekends, and so on to be where we are today. Thank you also to our donor, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, for making the necessary funds available, which allows us to provide the support. I wish that we can make a difference with this campaign. Stay healthy and mask up Ghana. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. Shall we give him another round of applause? GIZ is very particular about inclusion. And so this program on COVID-19 is focusing a lot on vulnerable population. And so we've been working with the persons with the deaf, GNAD, and then the blind. We are so grateful, GBU, for your support. I will immediately call on a, a statement from GNAD to deliver their short statement in support of this program. Thank you very much. We invite them to the podium. Okay. So maybe you will talk while. First and foremost, on behalf of the Ghana National Association of the Deaf, we want to thank you all, especially for GIZ, for wonderful support in terms of inclusion. At this important time when we are dealing with COVID-19. Currently, we started the project in various districts of Ghana. Now we are making a lot of more people aware of what COVID-19 is and the various measures they have to take to protect themselves. We are very grateful to you and your support. Second, we, we are grateful to Ghana government for their support and GID as well. If not for their support, we will not be able to do these projects. We thank you for that. Lastly, We also thank you for the PPE that you supply to us. Our members have received them, the nose masks and the other materials. We are really grateful and we hope that we will continue to have cooperation in terms of fighting against COVID-19. Thank you all. Shall we thank them again for the special message, appreciating all that GIZ has done, the provision, the training, and also Ghana government for supporting them. Indeed, it's important this time to include them in whatever we are doing. Thank you very much. I will invite GBU also to the podium to talk. They are actually partners for this particular project across the 100 districts and 16 regions of Ghana with Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service. Thank you. All protocol duly observed, 
Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Secretary Director of Ghana Blind Union, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the GIZ and the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service, and Hope for Future Generations. For us at GBU, COVID means not living. Because we have come to understand that COVID means do not get closer to people or you'll be infected. It also means do not touch things or you'll be infected. In other words, COVID means for us as visually impaired people, we should not interact and in other words we shouldn't see because we see with our hands so we are very grateful for this project because when covid first came the education was mostly on social media and was through visual content most of the members of ghana blind union did not get access to information regarding preventing themselves from getting covid but through this project, a lot of trainings have gone on, especially in different languages for the majority of our members who can hardly use social media content or speak our traditional English. Information has gone down to the very rural areas, helping them understand how they should wash their hands, how to wear their masks, and how to socially distance. Further, I would like to add that this information should go a long way to help the assistance and the caregivers of persons with visual impairment. Because we are more vulnerable if our caregivers do not understand how to protect themselves. They invariably infect us as persons with visual impairment. One last thing I'd like to add is that we are very excited as Ghana Blind Union that the vaccines have arrived. We are very, very excited. Because vaccine then means that our vulnerability will be somewhat limited. Once we are vaccinated, um, we will not be so much exposed to COVID. And so we would like the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service to recognize our vulnerability and acknowledge us to be part of those who receive these vaccines um, as part of their priority groups. In conclusion, to GIZ, to Hope for Future Generations, and to the Ministry of, of Health and the Ghanaian government, I'd like to say a very big thank you for recognizing our vulnerability, for recognizing that inclusion really is the key to development. Thank you very much. Please, can we give her another? Because of their vulnerability, they hope they will also be vaccinated, vaccinated now that the vaccine has come. And the Minister of Health is here. Uh, Director, uh, Health Promotion are all here. I believe they are hearing, they are listening to what they are saying. Thank you very much. Uh, Auntie Helen is also here representing Particip. She's the pool manager for Particip, the organization that contracted us to work with GIZ. If the Director General, Dr. Boaji, is here, we also call him to give a message. Otherwise, then we move immediately to Minister of Local Government in the person of Mr. Frank Reddy, Director General Administration from Minister of Local Government. Shall we welcome him to give us a message on the role of MMDAs in containing or combating COVID-19? Thank you very much. Good morning. Yes. 
I think our role has been specified, so I'm most going to deliver our message. Okay, thank you. Um, as you are aware, 19 countries is having a profound effect on local governance globally. Our MMDs, which is metropolitan, municipal, districts, are the front of this unprecedented health and economic crisis. They are constantly being faced with the following questions. One, how can they make sure that everyone has access to clean water, hand washing and sanitation to combat the virus? Two, how can communities manage their markets, prevent further spreading of the virus, to prevent further spreading of the virus while assuring local food supply? And the third one, how are decisions taken at the local level if assemblies are not able to? And the community is hit or most at risk by this. The MMDs. Consequently, places. MDAs have put in place the following measures to prevent the spread of disease. Firstly, and monitor the implementation of COVID-19 COVID directives within their areas of jurisdiction, especially at marketplaces, lorry parks, and other public places to prevent the spread of the virus. MMDAs carry out public health education on COVID-19 in all places within their jurisdiction, especially again at marketplaces, lorry parks, and other public places, using mobile, mobile vans, gun guns, and, uh, and any other means available to improve hygiene standards through regular cleanup and cleansing. They also enforce bylaws on food safety environmental sanitation, hygiene, and also on entertainment and outdoor activities. Ladies and gentlemen, MMDs have the primary responsibility for planning for and responding to any major emergency. These activities include the provision of facilities as facility, facility as, as quarantine centers for affected persons. undertaking periodic nationwide fumigation and disinfection exercise in all markets and lorry parks to curtail the spread of the COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, local governance, the local government are best place to adopt, our best place to adopt national policies to local circumstances. For instance, when it comes to local markets, local government leaders are in touch with the different community leaders who may not be pre pre presented at the national level, who may not be represented, sorry, at the national level. However, MMDs are often without the corresponding financial resources to carry out these functions effectively. This is aggravated by less local locally available resources due to economic recession as a result of the crisis whereas cost of local level costs at local level are increasing without the corresponding resources this adjustment to conclude i want to say we're going to thank the german government for augmenting the effort of the Ghana government in the fight against COVID-19. 
by launching the material for race communication for COVID-19 and for giving us the opportunity to educate the public on the role of MMDAs in the fight against the pandemic. I want to thank you all and wish you God blesses. Thank you very much, uh, Director, for this message. We are grateful. Indeed, the role of MMDAs is very important, and this program is actually being implemented in partnership of MMDAs. We are now at the verge of inviting the ambassador for Germany, uh, His Excellency, Ambassador Christoph Resraf from Germany to give us a message. We are grateful. Please, shall we welcome him with a big cloud? And we also welcome our Minister for Health. Thank you. Honorable Minister Designate of Health, Kwaku Ajiaman Manu, um, Directors of the Ghana Health Service, representatives of the of the DIF and the Ghana Blind Union. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start uh, this event today by congratulating you, Honorable Minister Designate, the Government of Ghana and uh, his Excellency the President uh, of Ghana. Uh, Ghana is the first country in the world, not only in Africa, the first country in the world. This morning, the first delivery COVID vaccines through the International Multilateral COVID Initiative. The first 600,000 doses of COVID vaccines out of 2.4 million doses arrived this morning at Kotoka International Airport. And I think this is a very important step, not only for Ghana and its citizens, but also for the whole of Africa. I'm happy to say that the European Union and my country, Germany, are among the major contributors for this international platform, COVAX. Germany alone is contributing 2.5 billion euro to this platform, COVAX, to finance the proliferation of COVID vaccines to countries in Africa, Asia, and around the world. COVID is still among us. COVID is a killer.
principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed.
and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed.
principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed.
and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed.
powers and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed.